All right, recording is running, so you all know the drill. Speak if you don't mind getting recorded, otherwise don't speak and mute. Uh, welcome to Dallas Personal Products Group, Robot Builders Night Vert Tool. Uh, today is the 18th of January in Dallas, um, and we're going to do the usual thing of going around the table and talking about projects, and with a few exceptions, mostly things related to robots and building robots. Um, just like usual, we have this kind of general ho housekeeping stuff. There's a really active uh, uh, Discord server. Um, if you'd like to be invited to that, uh, just send one of us a, a chat and we'll get a fresh invite. Uh, we are uh, having a little uncertainty in the moment in the club because we're normally having an annual meeting with an election uh, a few weeks ago that didn't occur and we're still chasing candidates. Together with that, we will have a, uh, uh, some bylaws proposal changes that are also in work. So uh, anyhow, uh, that's what's on the agenda coming up. Um, and by the rules, we'll, we'll propose a formal slate formally to a quorum. Uh, and then after at least two weeks, we can vote. Uh, so there's a two week spread between these two parts. Um, and then the other thing, the only other thing I know of on the calendar, I'm not, I'm not active listening uh, monthly presentations with the assumption that uh, someone will pick up the reins and carry that. But we do have uh, Jack Jones lined up, and I think he'll probably be ready to slide in pretty soon if we I like. Uh, and then there's another, uh, somebody has volunteered to uh, at some point or other maybe look at a Ross tutorial workshop kind of thing. And uh, I'm actually uh, at some point in the future unnamed uh, um, thinking about doing a presentation on a Tesla. Tesla self-driving, full self-driving beta. So um, that's what we got. Any other items to just list at this point in the housekeeping slide? All right, with that, having said- Oh, oh go ahead. I was I did have a question. Um, is anybody interested in kind of the developments of Gerbil and Merlin and a lot of the things we use for 3D printers or laser cutters or that kind of stuff? No. Oh, Doug is, okay. What did you say, herbal? Gerbil. Yeah, it's what's used in um, a lot of the CNC, small CNC mills. Oh. And it it's also used now in in larger mills. Um, there's been several forks of it that people have done. Um, I've seen one for the ESP32, um, another one for um, the um, what is it? ST. Uh, kind of a mega, a mega upgrade because there used to be a, a ramps board that sat on top of that that drove, you know, the stepper drivers and um, paid attention to, you know, limit switches and turn spindles on and that kind of stuff. Um, uh, that's with one of the SAM, um, SAM processors, which is another, 30, you know, 32-bit part. Um, I think... Two Trees, I think, is the name of the company. They've done a bunch of stuff. Uh, they sell products through Micro Center. You can upgrade, you know, your printer controller if you want to. Um, yeah, stuff I like was, that. I was pretty impressed with the big. As a Micro Center, I don't know. Well, when I'm not not a Micro Center, but uh, Big Tree Tech has got a whole. Literally, with the exception of the extrusions. And a couple of things you might be able to walk in the micro center and piece and part you an entire uh, cutter or 3D printer or a couple of things as far as all the electronics and all that kind of stuff just sitting there on the wall. And they got the yeah, they sell a bunch of they got the different and... boards, they got all the stuff. Yeah, I was yeah. like, wow, that's crazy, cool, mm -hmm. crazy.
rep for like the last 20 years and he knew my machine inside and out. He told me to um, uh, check some of the voltages, you know, power supply voltages on the board and don't set them at the power supply, set them at the board because I was getting these, you know, communication errors and stuff like that. He nailed it like, you know, knew right away pretty much what was wrong with it. And um, so I, but in the meantime, I was looking at all these upgrades or replacement uh, for all the controller boards in the thing because they're, you know, they were designed, I think that mill was produced like 1983 and you can't get any of the parts anymore. Bridgeport's not in business anymore. Um, so, you know, I was looking around for an alternative if I couldn't get it fixed, but then uh, managed to get it fixed. So just by adjusting some of the voltages on it. And, um, I tell you, it does some dangerously crazy things when the voltages aren't set the way you want them. So like going past limit switches and uh, stuff like that. So. Well, um, Greg, I, I have a, I think they call it, it's by the company Super Gerbil. Uh, oh, okay. I have yep. one on my laser printer and I do mm -hmm. hit, I did, get their three channel one from their kickstarter that oh, okay. you know I've, I've been keeping in reserve in case my little tiny mill uh drops its controller yep. right now it's using linux cmc it's actually i think better but the problem is uh you know it's it's kind of a quirky I and mean, i've got a box that's this you know like like this sitting on and on a shelf that is the actual driver to the to the mill and, oh, okay. and I had to build a, uh, a, uh, a serial, uh, no, a parallel break, parallel breakout board. Okay. Oh so, yeah. Yeah. So the yeah. input to this big box is, is specific pins on the parallel port. Right. So yeah. I had to find me a computer with a parallel port. So you know what, you know what generation yep. that is that's like ancient yeah and yep. then you run into with cnc uh, with linux cnc uh since it's a linux system it's you know to overcome all of the all of the latency problems you mm -hmm. have to run a special uh what do they call it special version okay mm -hmm. uh well, God, what do they call it the actual core of Linux, uh, it's different. I can't mm -hmm. think of the name of it right now. But anyway, that uh, but having all that still doesn't necessarily work unless the board, unless the computer happens to be built a certain way. At the Super Gerbil board. Yeah. Yep. Now, a few things I'm not sure about Gerbil. Uh, I don't think it, it, you know, you have a lot of, in your bridge board, you have a lot of macros that do a whole bunch of stuff. Yeah. And I really haven't looked at Gerbil macros or to see if they, if, like, for example, you don't want to plunge, you know, you know if you're going to make a mill, mill of slot, you don't want to just plunge into it. Right. You want to kind of like ramp down through it and then come back. Yeah. There's a whole yeah. bunch of stuff like that that I'm not sure Gerbil is. I mean, well, it's actually, well, I don't think it can do it. You know what I mean? But I don't know. That, yeah. It, yeah. Maybe the, is it? I think it. Now that I think about it, maybe it's just translating uh, G commands. If that's the case, then obviously whatever's the program behind it. Now I will tell you one that I would look at. Even it was a. You okay. can't use that for uh, lasers. It's mm -hmm. a big push on that right yeah. now. Oh, yeah. yeah. 
laser cutters engravers slash something low ends on my uh, bucket list to, list to go. And so my YouTube feed is littered with people reviewing those. And there's a couple of folks that show up all the time. But regardless who's reviewing them, almost literally 99% of them are using light burn to do whatever it is they're doing. So, yeah. you know, you can do something else, but you're probably, I mean, there's probably a reason that they're all using that, whatever the expense is. I thought the expense wasn't, I looked it up, what is it, like 80, 90 bucks or something for a copy yeah, so, or something? Yeah, yeah. And I, I, it's a little expensive, but if you're going to do the thing, man, let's, you know, you're, you're spent a, you spent several hundred dollars anyway to get the thing. Why don't you spend a little bit more to make you maybe make use of it uh, as effectively as you can? Actually, I think the version that works on Gerbil mm -hmm. uh, is actually, I think, around $50. If well, I'm that'd not be mistaken. better. Yeah, that's I, I believe. Now, I might be off some. I don't know what inflation is doing now or anything, but yeah. there's two, two levels. That's there's one. Even that, I think, like Carol's right, I think it's like at most 90 bucks. Mm hmm. Is uh, anybody heard of um, Mach 3 or Mach 4 software? Yeah, yeah, I've heard it. It's sort of yeah. a, a Windows replacement, a Windows equivalent to Linux CNC. Right. And it's yeah. expensive. Yeah. Like, and if I were going to, if I were going to do that, if I were going to do that, I'd, I'd look again at Linux CNC. I'm the mm -hmm. one I'm using is is like you know it's Ubuntu 14 or 12, so it's that's how old it is. Yeah. Uh, but I don't dare change it because it works. Mm -hmm. And uh, so with the new one, new version, uh, the Linux CNC may have some additional. It may be it may 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 now, but it actually sends the commands to the mill just like Mach 4 does uh-huh it doesn't send g-code to a board yep all right so yep. that's that's the that's the difference that's the real power of you know something like or super gerbil or one of the other ones yeah so yeah and i think um the guy he's out of australia i believe okay yeah, yeah super i kind of In the case of C uh, Linux CNC, you're using, you know, a computer with Linux on it, and that's pretty much running or doing the details that Gerbil would do with a microprocessor. Um, the the implementations that are using like an ESP32 or the STMF407, um, those are kind of like microprocessor upgrades. You know, you, you were using an 8-bit machine, now you're using a 32-bit machine. The, the 407 has floating points, so, um, you know, it's just going to be a lot faster. Um, I think the, yeah. like, one of the figures of merit is the, um, it's, I think they refer to it as a stepping rate. And mm -hmm. Gerbil on like a 328p was around 30 kilohertz. Yeah. And with the 407, you can get up to 500 kilohertz. So it's, you know, orders of magnitude, you know, faster. And the Super Gerbil is, a, is an STM, I want to say it's an F4, but I don't, I'm not sure. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. I've, I've seen other implementations with the blue. a lot more boards out there you know mm -hmm. um, you know a lot of it's 
relatively inexpensive, like, oh, $200 is kind of the high end for, for one of these boards, you know. Mm -hmm. um, there's there's one that works with Linux CNC for, I think, $23. You can get it anywhere, you know, eBay, um, Amazon. Um, yeah, I'd like to see that's like something that I might be interested in since I've already got a set up for that. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. But, but kind of sounds like it's a niche niche market out there it seems like yeah. some people either you're kind of interested or you're not interested <laughs> it seems like most people are not interested though, in this audience <laughs> so I guess doug and i maybe harold um i don't know if anybody else is well i'm sure that uh uh kareem is is running into that in his cnc machine too what are you running kareem uh we're running mach 3. Mark three. Oh, you are doing Mark three. Okay. Yep. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I wanted to upgrade to Mach four, but because uh, like Mach three, I think the Windows Vista is the most recent. No way. I think we managed to get it working on Windows seven, um, uh, and uh, uh, yeah, we've been wanting to upgrade, but uh, our that requires a driver change, uh, and the, the 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 CNC we have doesn't have a driver for Mach four. Oh. Hmm. Um, driver change. You mean the board that actually goes between your actual motor drives and? So, so your... I have a I, I have a I have a dedicated controller that comes that came with the CNC. So Mach three is just sending it uh, commands. Um, okay. Um, high level commands. So basically, it's it's just refactoring the the g-code a little bit and sending the g-code mm -hmm. on to the uh, to the dedicated controller okay um, but it's a dumb controller so it would require for mach 4 it would require a driver built for, uh, for that particular unit okay so what, what do you actually get with the more expensive software so i use the stl cam for most of what i do and i wouldn't even dream of buying something more expensive than that what do you actually get out of spending the 200 bucks? Um, you get pretty much, you know, a board that, um, uh, some of them will have like dedicated, um, drivers on the board. So, you know, you're kind of fixed to whatever motor size that driver can handle other than um, other ones will have, um, you know, empty sockets that you can get, you know, enable step and direction out um for up to six axes if you want um the you're, you're getting much faster update rates so your uh, each cut for the pocket is going to have a certain feed rate and you know that's that's like one line of g-code and it does a lot of stuff um you can do um you know like drilling cycles where you're or, you know you can you can say okay i've got a circle i want so many holes spaced around the circle and they're they're drilled at a certain rate and you can do um either pecking so where you you drill down and then you you bring it up a little bit to break the chips there's just uh, you know a lot more of the sophisticated things that um like the higher level g codes do um like i i actually created um a pretty simple program to cut out a um a one and three eighths hole in the center of a two by two piece of aluminum to stick a bearing in the bearing the outside diameter is one and three eighths and in gerbil um it took like you know the file was like 16k uh bytes long in in g code it's less than 10 lines you know so it's it's amazing what you can do with these more sophisticated g codes um so okay. you get you know 
Go ahead, Doug. Oh, I was just going to say that Gerbil is just a G code, G code to stepper motor converter, if you want to think of it. So yeah. the, the real power of the, the higher processors and stuff are that they can handle, like, let's say you're trying to make a 90 degree turn. Well, there's a lot of uh, acceleration, jerk, you know, speed stuff that you have to take into calculation there. And right. as Gerbil advances, those things. Thirty degrees, excuse me, sixty degrees. Uh, it's in a circle. I mean, that's just G code that you would send to send to the machine. What well, some of these boards, I think Mach four, for example, Mach three or four, for example, does is that you can have ma macros that you can purchase. I don't even think they're part of the original cost of two hundred dollars. If that, I thought it was even more than that. I thought it was like four hundred dollars. Uh, they they actually have you can buy their like library of macros to handle those specific problems so uh, yeah i think that but the real difference is and i from what it, what it originally was i don't know what it sounds like on kareem's it's a little different but originally it literally sent the commands to the stepper motors Right. Yeah, that was way back when right. they were using yeah. parallel port uh, yeah. banging, right. banging parallel mm -hmm. ports. Mine right. is uh, connected via USB, so. Yeah, so right. now there must be, you know, because that was a dead end. You couldn't go any further with that. Right. So yeah. right now, they're, it sounds to me they're essentially using something like a Gerbil board. They're, Either feeding, uh, feeding some sort of board, board that does the purpose of durable. Now, there's like I say, there's accelerate. There's all sorts of, of mechanical factors of when you're cutting that can be built into the durable light board. All right, and that that's why you have different controllers at different price points. Okay, you know, if I don't yeah. know if I covered that didn't said that all perfectly right but that's kind of what, what's going on there no no i think thank you guys both for the answers uh, so i i do a lot of really basic stuff you know like single side maybe double-sided board sometimes and, and just cutting pieces and parts out so what i've got for a very very basic machine is fine but if i ever upgrade to something you know much more serious then i would absolutely consider buying the more capable software like putting mm -hmm. a a hundred dollar scope on a two thousand dollar line board. We just don't do that. Yeah. So, all right. Yeah. Well, one thing I would be, you know, would say is, uh, is when you move away from PC boards to something like milling aluminum, rigidity is the key. And most machines under a thousand dollars really aren't truly rigid enough. Uh, I mean, just from, you know, looking at all of the, because I would love to have, you know, a router that would affect, would would be able to mill large sheets of aluminum. Uh, well, when I say that, I'd, I'd be happy at 12 by 12, you know what I mean? Yeah. But, uh, That's large. No. Yeah, you know, I think my little, the little mill I've got right now, it's a Shoreline mill. So, you know, it's probably got a, probably 14 by six that it can do and that, that might be that might be over overstating what it can do and it's on the edge of rigidity you know and you've probably seen these mini mills if you're interested in this they're they're a little bigger but um and they still 
have rigidity problems because you know you, it would be nice to even do steel if you had to but to get mm -hmm. that you got to get like what ray's got unless you do something like i occasionally do which is just like run over or push over a, a screw or something but that's a different story oh, cool. <laughs> uh, we can't but, but, we can't do steel but we can do aluminum pretty yeah. pretty pretty well yeah 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 the bridgeport is a beast it's uh weighs like three thousand pounds it's the rigid <laughs> head one um the, I was kind of curious, like, you know, we, we talk about like ounce inches uh, for torque on, you know, these little NEMA 17s and NEMA 23s and, you know, um, foot pounds of torque so on these screws it's actually um uh 80 inch pounds of torque no no foot pounds you or, said foot pounds oh foot pounds let's see did you say foot pounds or, eight, or foot in 40 or pound inches or kilo newton meters yeah yeah i think it's actually foot pounds so okay. it's 80 foot pounds of torque but it's on you know a uh, um, you know a, a ball nut lead screw with you know that's maybe an inch and a half across or so so you mm -hmm. know there's a whole lot more force on that than you know that would be on something that was really large so because you're maybe you have like three quarters of an inch of the you know the screw it's very you know relatively small mm -hmm. but yeah I, I was just amazed at all the stuff out there and how much you know it's changed since oh, i don't know maybe i think i've had that 3d printer for like four years now and uh you know they were pretty expensive back then and um just like i don't know it's just proliferated everywhere you know there's companies popping up that do boards that do mills that do you know you name it so hey jason you say you cut uh, pcbs uh, how work well what size mill do you have is it one of the little what do they call them 16 16 yeah, 11, the, 60 11s or something or yeah 30, 18. i bought oh. it uh on sale at micro center they were oh, okay. <laughs> clearing them out so i was like oh this is cool so it's taken years of poking at it every now and then to mm -hmm. get everything set right and make it to where I can actually produce a, you know, something in repetition. It, it really. I think they're two hundred dollars now for the mill. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, it's 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 been cool, frustrating, but cool. Yeah, I have one too, but <laughs> I haven't touched it in a while. In fact, since then I had gotten that one in the Santa Labs, and they have another one. So let me show you all this, so y'all might want to look into it. Uh, let's see. So there's this company and they had the version before this one that I actually have. This is their version two. And it can do different type of mills on that. And as Doug said, the main thing is rigidity. Yeah. rigidity. So noticing here that they have the raw instead of a belt type ribbon. So that helps greatly and they it comes in two different sizes so and they actually have the smaller version which is like 12 by 12 for that price and they're very good on documentation so um yeah that looks like it's got the like 3d printers have a cloned yeah. y 
Axis. So you had to us about, you know, three G center and yeah. So you know, if y'all want to know stuff about it, they're they're very So yeah, and so okay. So they started off way back, yeah, in two thousand nineteen, and that was for their law mills. So it was actually their first one was before that. Ah, so here we go over here is where they change it. So they talk about the fee and speed thing, and mm -hmm. materials. Okay, so it can do aluminum. Yeah, but, but that speed. I would argue that's probably not is yeah. really on the average on the edge of three well, yeah, and it's a matter of speed yeah. and the bit at that stage. Yeah. So, let's see. So yeah, see they're using the cis zero cis one aluminum. And yeah, I know it's they say it's on the upper limit of hardness. So okay, yeah. Yeah, but you know, I would say for information stuff, that this is a good spot, and it's a pretty good company. I was so very impressed. I mean, I didn't get it through the kits, or I got it right after the kits, are, but they deliver it prompt, and yeah, it's been a nice little machine. Uh, they have the original out there. Uh, no, they don't. Let's see if I can pull up. The other page, you know. so let me. Hey, Kareem, do you do anything that's uh, besides plates? So, um, yeah, we're two and a half D, three D. And if you want to build one on Instructable, see, this is the original one, that's the one I actually have. So, yep. So yeah, so if you want to build and it's it's basically open source and it's all the information you need is here, including the different files. Hey guys, I'm gonna suggest we, uh, we park the CNC discussion for a few minutes at least. Uh, Kareem has some updates uh, and he, he needs to bug out at, after that shortly. Okay. Yeah, I gotta I gotta take off. I can really quickly say that we've done like three quarter inch deep uh, aluminum parts is probably mm -hmm. the maximum depth dimension that we've done so far. Wow. Um, uh, yeah, quick quick update. I, I already put it in the in the chat, but basically we heard that the um, the, the six robots are shipping that are were, were picked up today. Finally, uh, they're in Las Vegas and they're on their way, uh, presumably. Uh, but the delivery date is is next Tuesday, um, and uh, and I'm just you know careful to not actually expect it on <laughs> on Tuesday, uh, given the amount of COVID that's going around and uh, just you know everything with the shipping delays. But uh, that's the best news. That's that's the that's the most I've got um, uh, for about a month now. So um, uh, yeah, but I'll update the the list when I have some more information. But um, but yeah, right now, maybe as early as next Tuesday, Wednesday, something like that. Any questions? Hey, Murray. Hi, guys. If I'm not on the list and you still have extras, I'm still interested. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Green, it's got to feel good to have backlog after those first early days there. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, sorry, I've missed a ton of meetings. What robots did you guys buy? Uh, this is an auction of uh, Pioneer 380s. They're like from uh, the And uh, base electronics to be terribly useful, but they do have sonar arrays on them. Uh, I believe all of them do. Um, and uh, like 
I think, 12 to 16 um, uh, sonars on each one, something like that. So, uh, but we don't know how uh, uh, how usable they are, what kind of shape they're in. Um, but we did a sort of group purchase, <laughs> and uh, uh, we're we're going to see how it works out. All the weapons were removed. And cool. stuff. <laughs> yeah, they they actually had that that notice on there that there's no more decommissioning required. Um, but I don't think these have ever had uh, weapons on them. They're not that big. They're only like uh, I think they're about uh, if I recall. I think they have a. I think if I'm not mistaken, they have a poison spur on one of their back legs, like the platypus. Yeah. Is a wombat bigger than? Uh, I do have to bounce, uh, so. Okay. Well, how, how's the team going before you bounce? Uh, they're 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 going okay. Um, they've got their next competition on the fifth. Um, so, yeah, we've got a got 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 some work to do to get get their working properly. Uh, we will uh, uh, probably have them try to join like next Tuesday or the following Tuesday, uh, and give you an update on on where they are. Okay, that's cool. Are they still doing stretchy? They are. Yep. Okay. <laughs> yeah, it's it's, uh, it's and it's still falling over all the time. They're actually <laughs> working on limiting their lateral acceleration on that the rear swerve module to uh, prevent that from happening. Uh, it happens more often when the robot just stops suddenly, right? Mm -hmm. uh, it's got it's developed to some returning momentum, and then all of a sudden, it's the the drivers wang it in the other direction, and uh, uh, and that's when it's it's likely to topple. They're also working on lowering the center of gravity, so they've redesigned the so that uh, they can put the primary drive motor inside the wheel, um, and uh, they've already <laughs> seen the uh, switching over to carbon fiber for those new wheel modules. They've already CNC'd the the side plates for those, but uh, haven't gotten to the point of um, finishing. That's actually a problem they've got is the new design requires uh, a lathe uh, and uh, uh, to build the motor housing. And uh, so we're having trouble, you know, sourcing time on a, on a lathe. You know, David Ackley has a lathe and so does Ray. So, oh, really? Yeah. I mean, I have one too, but it's it's really tiny, so I'm not sure that's uh, uh, viable. But we've got to turn these two-inch tubes down, uh, tiny little um, this two-inch aluminum diameter. Uh, mm -hmm. They're probably like four inches long, roughly like that. Mm -hmm. So, Kareem, if if they still have the trouble with this kind of longish tricycle-shaped platform falling over, I I, I highly recommend, if I haven't already, that I ought to dig up the Benny Hill skit for the tricycles and show it to them. Yeah. Absolutely. That would be choice. It, it, that would be it, choice. It, it, <laughs> it is entertaining. <laughs> exactly. But then you'd have to show them the other parts, too. So I don't know. It's uh, mm -hmm. uh, you probably get in trouble. <laughs> Well, there was uh, we had a list and we, we kind of jumbled up a little bit. So uh, if we still had CN, I was going to say if we still had CNC stuff, we could finish that conversation up. Otherwise, we had uh, John G, and then I had a quick something, and then Doug B. But Doug, it looks like uh, yeah, I, I still I just have a little small accomplishment that I just yeah. just to encourage myself. So. <laughs> 
Yeah. I got something to, get out or go to deal, something to show, okay. but no. So, so back, on, back on the list then. So, uh, so yeah. was there any other things that missed the conversation of the CNC that we got started on? Okay, no. Having, yeah. uh, having crossed that bridge, then John, I think you've been very patiently waiting for a while, so. All right. Yeah, I'm glad after, you clarified that was that was. After you're quickly raising your hand to be volunteer as first, so you need to reward <laughs> that. Yeah, so I'm, I'm glad to clarify that that was er, that was herbal and not herbal. I was trying to figure out how, you know, herbs herbs had anything to do with 3D printing and CNC, unless it was like it was like cilantro and well, filament. You know? It's good for the colon, you know. It's good for the colon and the cleanse and not. Yeah, cilantro and filament. Yeah, there you go. Edible, edible G R B L. It's that's the uh, so, so anyway, for review, um, in case you didn't know, I was working on my next Halloween project, uh, where I would I borrowed a design from the web for some uh, animatronic eyes, uh, controlled by servos, and um, that was gonna basically inc incorporate some face following software with a camera so that when people walk up to the to the front of my front door at Halloween that the eyes follow their face. So um, had, I would have presented something, some progress a couple of weeks back, but I had a little setback. Um, I, when I first powered everything up, um, about a minute later, I said, no, what's that smell? <laughs> well, I had mistaken my 12 volt uh, DC adapter for a 5 volt DC adapter and promptly burned up six servos. So. Um, <laughs> I, I got uh, six more servos and now I've, I've put some software together and I've got some partial progress to show for it. So let's go ahead and present screen. All right, so can you see that? Fancy mm -hmm. UI. Okay. So I'm um, running on my Raspberry Pi here. I put together some uh, uh, Python program to help me tune my uh, uh, six servos here uh, that are part of the, the design. And um, yeah, this, this is a generic package where uh, it's, I'm using this to talk to a uh, Adafruit 16 channel servo controller. And it's all configurable so I can just replace, I can replace any of these titles and have as many servos in here as I want. And uh, so that I put this together so that I can tune the limits of the of the mechanism because it's not very precise when you put it together. You have to figure out, you know, just how much, how far you can go to the left and to the right, up, down, and open and close the eyelids. So uh, I've got all that tuning done. And so I've got some preset buttons here. Right now it's the neutral position. So I can I can look to the upper right, upper left, and go lower left, lower right. Let's go back go back to neutral position. I can uh, I can blink it. We can, go, we can close them. Oh, we can go uh, we can go full open. Are you going to be winking at trick or treaters? What? Are you going to make it wink or just at the parents? Uh, well, hey, you know that's uh, I didn't that didn't occur to me, but uh, I can throw in a wink in, in addition to the blank. <laughs> and it can also take this slider here and just move my eyes back and forth. Yeah. Oh, I'll be worth a silver star. Cylon mode. <laughs> yep, that's definitely. Absolutely. And can it give? Can it give the evil eye? Is that an option? The evil eye. What, what's the evil eye? You know, it's kind of like raising one right eyebrow. There, that is the evil eye. <laughs> oh, well, you've given me all sorts of uh, interesting ideas. Raising one eyelid, uh, blinking yeah. eyelid, a single eye, a pair of eyelids. Yeah, I could, I could throw those presets in there pretty easy. Yeah. Um, How about the old cross-eyed thing? No, unfortunately, the, the, the mechanical part of the design has the two eyes linked together. Ah, with single, okay. With a single arm. So, you can also uh, do the... You could also do the horror movie thing where you have the eyeballs rotate up inside the head. Oh yeah. Uh, well, let's see. That's that's this axis right here. That's about as, that's as far as I can go. Ah, uh, guess maybe you got to close the lid a little. You know, roll it up under the lid. Yeah, is the yeah. lid open and closed, or can you squint? Is it like variable, proportional? Yeah, use uh, the upper lid. 
Well, I can, oh, the, if I can do a squint here, let's see. Um, let's see, let's change the upper lid. Now roll, roll the eye, eye up. Oh, that's good. Oh, you and, can roll the, and roll the eyes up. Okay. There's an evil oh, eye. Yeah. Right there. See, now yeah. you're talking. There oh, we go. yeah. Oh, yeah. That's kind of creepy. <laughs> and now lower the lower, <laughs> lower one. Lower the lower one on the, yeah. on the right here. I foresee a call to CPS or something. I see. I foresee a call to CPS or something eventually at Holloway. So is us telling John what to do an example of remote control? <laughs> Voice control. Hey John. Yeah, well, did you see that? I mean. It's voice control because it, it just did it while we were watching, right? We just uh, told it what to do and it just did it. Did you see anything move? It's sentient. <laughs> if John is a robot, then that would be an example of telerobotics, right? <laughs> yeah, because you we 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 did the tele and he did the robotic. I you know ready to go. We don't know that John's not a robot, do we? Uh, is that the Gauthier test versus the Turing test? I'm not sure, but uh, so that's my progress so far. The next the next step is I'm printing uh, some uh, some additional supports. I need to put a camera right above the eyeballs, so that uh, once I have a, a camera mounted, a Pi camera mounted up there, the next step will be to uh, to essentially to align wherever the eyeballs are looking with a portion of the image that I'm seeing through the camera so that once it identifies a face at a particular set of coordinates, then I'll map the, uh, the motion of the eyes to that particular set of coordinates in the image. Hey, John, yeah. uh, I don't know what you're going to house this in, but if it, one of the thoughts was you could have, you know, the third eye where it's supposed to be like here. <laughs> have you ever seen those? Uh, the third eye of Cyclops, you mean? Uh, no, it, you know, no, it's the third eye. It's supposed to be one that sees uh, the all seeing eye. Yeah, something like that. Uh, you could just have sort of one of these eyes picture. If it's going to be, is it going to be a head or a skull or what is it going to be? Well, unfortunately, the, the design is, uh, is kind of squarish and I would love to fit it into like a 3D printed skull. No. Uh, I did download a, mo a full-size model of a, a skull that I'm, that I'm putting together to see if that could possibly be used. But I doubt that with the exterior and, and uh, on the right and left of this and the bottom that it will actually fit unless I completely, you know, I would come up with my own design for the base, uh, making some careful measurements of his design because he, he, he only provides the STL files for these mm. parts. Um, I would have to come up with a similar 3D model to see if I can compact this in such a way that I could fit it inside a skull. Another thing you might think of, uh, if you go out to Instructables, there's at least one Instructable on how to make skulls from old milk cartons. Okay. So yeah, you take, I think I've seen that. You, know, you take it and you heat it with a heat gun and basically press it into a mold onto a, excuse me, you cut it up the back, take it off, and uh, you're talking about like polyethylene milk bottles? Yeah. Oh, the, yeah, like a plastic yeah. jug. Right, and there's, you know, instructions on how to make them look more bone-like and aged and all that stuff, but it's not Instructables. Yeah. Instructables great for Halloween projects. So. Harold has a skull, don't you? Well, I hope we all do. I hope we all do. No, Harold <laughs> is a 3D printed skull. Mostly, I have a face mask, not a skull. Oh, yeah. Okay. Well, I'm going to get the, the work on getting the, the whole concept working first. Uh, and after I've got this where I've got it to where it, it can track faces and move the eyes, then I'll move on to seeing if, that, um, if I can if basically mount it inside anything. I think the bare minimum, if I have just the eye showing and just cover up and just have holes, I, I should have a lower portion uh, where I can have a moving jaw. Uh, I think that's my bare minimum. I'd like to have a moving jaw and then maybe mm -hmm. put some sound in there where, you know, when somebody walks up, you know, and it's 
it's maybe tracking them, tracking their face, and suddenly the eyes go full open and it screams. <laughs> nice. Another thought, though, might be also, you know, those masks you buy around Halloween where they're rubber and you put them over your head, your, your whole head fits over it. You might be able to fit it into one of those, but I don't know yeah. about the movable jaw. You'd have to look at it. Yeah. Hey, John. Yeah, you, yeah you, okay, go ahead. Where did you buy those eyes at? Oh, that was the interesting part. That was the most uh, complicated part of the project to uh, complete. Those are actually, I 3D printed those. And uh, okay. if, you follow, if you follow the guy's instructions, you can see how he actually, um, he, he actually paints the iris himself. And I, had, I went through it several times to try to get the same results as him. And, uh, and then the, those 3D printed eyes, the iris is kind of recessed. Uh, he then has you cast it in resin and then polish the, the resin cast so they get the nice shiny outside. So yeah, I, and then the, if you look closely, you could see the like the little veins in there, the red veins. That's cotton threaded cotton thread that's glued to the outside before you cast it. Wow, nice. So, yeah, that's, that, was the, that was a tough part of it, but I managed to, to get through it and it actually required quite a bit of extra materials like the paint and the casting resin and, and making a mold and so on. But I, I like the way it came out. Nice. Yeah, it looks good. Is that from a, a thing of ours or, or is it a guy that has a website or uh, where did you get the, not, the STL file of that? It's not Thingiverse. It's, uh, here, let me, let me go to my screen here. I actually have the link. Yeah, if you can post it, it would be nice. Here we go. Mm -hmm. I'll copy that link. It's this uh, Nil, Nilhelm Mechatronics guy. Uh, and we'll post that in chat. What I was going to what I was going to say was that uh, with my mask over here, you know, I got a Raspberry Pi behind it, and I do a bunch of stuff with uh, speech synthesis and that kind of thing. That you could, um, that not only <laughs> you could look, and then you could do the screen, and then you could tell them a dad joke, and you could look up that dad joke over the internet because I got a bunch of them, and that's just some of that just pretty funny stuff. Now I don't know which would be scarier, the screen or the dad joke, but. You know, there you go. I'll let that up. Yeah. If I, if I get a moving, you got, you're giving me all sorts of good ideas. Um, I mean, if I get a moving jaw on there, then I might actually not just open it to scream, but actually have it move as if it's talking. Move to the thing. And that's one of that's one of my one of my things on my Mr. Big Head over here is I would like to put at least just kind of a uh, an LED light panel behind it so that when I do do the text to speech, I'm I have seen some things where it should give me syllables or something so maybe i could flash the light on and off with the syllables and stuff and make it something going on there right so i don't know how hard that is to do I, i've only seen exam seen a couple of references to it and i've not really read what how they actually work but i mean the text to speech world pick your cloud pick your cloud vendor and there and like in, i know in the azure world there's 500,000 free characters a month for text to speech and pick your voice. So well, I don't, I doubt your Halloween thing will overrun that, but I'm sure AWS and Google and everybody else has something similar. And, you know, pick your weapon of choice on that one. Yeah. It's real easy to use. You send off a web thing, you get back, you get back a, a, a wave, you throw it out the Raspberry Pi or whatever port you have for audio, and it's done. Well, it's either that, or if you just want to do a moving a jaw that seems to move in in time to the word to the speech, yeah, um, you can just do it based on volume. Have the jaw yeah, open, open and close according to the peak volume you know that that it's hearing. And that that would you know that might be close enough, right? Because I mean, you just been, <laughs> been yelled at and by the, this creepy thing, and I don't think you're going to be paying that much attention to how it synced up. You know, <laughs> that's true. I mean. Um, and then, and then even so, also there's quite a bit of slot when it comes to the eyeballs tracking faces, but you know, it's, it's just got to be close. I love this group. You just can't bring an idea to the group. Huh. <laughs> <laughs> this no. is awesome. It's fantastically well, awesome. Well, I will continue to take suggestions as the project progresses and see what I can do and, and what I can't do. 
Well, we appreciate the opportunity to brainstorm on someone else's project, so that's cool. <laughs> remember Jeff on we, the we have, no, we have no lack of brain power. That's the one power that never runs out around here. Yeah, I mean, like, you see other stuff, but not brain power. And this is this is generic. This this is a generic Python program. It's all configurable. So if anybody wants something, if they got a 16 channel or an root 16 channel controller, and they want to uh, use this to play with the servos, I can I can give that to them. I'd like it. Send okay. it to me. Who? who uh, how do I? Just send me the GitHub link. Oh, it's not on GitHub. Oh, okay. Well, just uh, send. Send me the phone. Uh, I'd say uh, put your names in the chat if you'd like John to provide it, and you yeah. can we can trade the emails offline or something. I'll after. I'll I'll put it on my um yeah just give me the emails and I'll put it on put the code on my um, Dropbox. Okay, uh, just so so you know, members, you don't don't put your email here. You just uh, John, just go to the the DPRG members page. And there's an email link for everybody. Okay. Yeah, it's encoded, so you know you, that's why you don't get any skimp spam or anything off of it. But all right, uh, I'll, I'll put it up on Dropbox and then uh, mm -hmm. post that. Cool. Any questions? Very nice, John. Did you ever watch? Very good. Yeah. yeah, good, John. Good one. Silver star, at least I think we had, right? Yeah, uh, it's a it's a black star, but it's oh come it's, on, <laughs> I, I, I you nice got you got black and gold. That's it. Black is the new gold. Really? Okay. Yeah, yeah. All right, well you got that. I mean, if anybody figures out how to you know embed a colored star without using a JPEG or something, I'm all for it. Okay. Yeah. All right. Uh, so I had something marginally related. Then we had uh, Doug P, then Ray. So uh, think about if you want to jump in the queue after Ray. Now for mine, uh, the, the only tie-in that I have for uh, robots is that uh, if you guys would remember back, uh, or, or just for telling those that weren't there at the time, so four or five years ago, a few of us in the club put together this beer-finding robot for an AT&T hackathon and it actually uh, worked well enough in the uh, in the pre pre trials that we it 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 paid for four of us three or four of us to get flown to Las Vegas and present. But then it failed miserably because Wi Fi that we had we had relied at the time on a good Wi Fi signal and uh, the phone we were using down here and on was only uh, 2.4 gigahertz and we needed five. So if you ever try to run Wi Fi at like a CES level show in Vegas. It just doesn't work. So we flubbed miserably. And anyhow, I was thinking of that when I noticed. Um, video doorbell. Whoops, just a second. Cam. Stop it. Monitor the house while Stop we're it. away. Okay. So that, 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 that came to mind whenever I saw this headline today, right? Because. Oh, God, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right? Because here we have, we've been hearing about it for a long time. And then finally, uh, uh, today there is this big thing about airlines or. They're just not going to fly. They're going to shut down all kinds of uh, carrier of a uh, uh, passenger and cargo traffic uh, because of the five G deployment. Uh, well, I've since heard that, one or the other. <laughs> I've since heard that, that they've reached a negotiation that they're only going to um, they're not going to deploy the five G around the most dense airports, which seemed to be where the biggest issue was. But but anyhow, that's it, it's, it reminded me of, of this where, you know, we're all still fighting wireless connections somehow or other, right? And then, then I noticed also not long ago, there was this ad, and I can't seem to find the, uh, the playing one, but uh, how would you like to climb the world's tallest cell tower in heels? So uh, anyhow. And then have somebody spin you around on that thing or something. <laughs> you know? Well, they didn't spin her around, but in the actual ad, if you can find the ad, they have an Airbus 380 flying around circles like King Kong around uh, around I guess uh, Fay Ray or something but anyhow that's all I got so just a quick update on the 5G with the airplanes turns out it works everywhere except the United States I don't know about that well let's hope none of our enemies find out about this and do a terrorist attack or something well for the longest time they they thought standard cell phone 
would inter interfere with uh, avionics, and that just turned out not to be true. It just well in, true, in the early terminal. days there were cases of it though because the it turns out that um, the, in the earliest days that the planes the uh, uh, avionics weren't hardened against certain kinds of noise, and oh. in, in the early days the certain kinds of uh, cell phone radios, if they were in the just the wrong place inside the plane. You have this big long conductive tube with all these windows, and it looks like guess what? It looks like a giant slot antenna. So what would happen is is that you get this near um, this this signal coming off from the uh, from the cell phone, and it would couple through the windows, looking like a slot antenna, and conduct along the skin of the aircraft, get into the avionics. And I think they actually did have at least a couple of cases where um, they they with confidence. We're able to show that it, uh, like, it caused the navigation system to put them off course for 20 minutes till they figured it out. Mm -hmm. But that was the early days. I think you're right. I think a lot has changed since then. I mean, we've gone, we've gone from the old, um, what was the old AM, uh, AM I mean, FM, FM modulation, modulation and now it's yeah. spread spectrum, and so I think a lot of things have changed, and the avionics have hardened as well. But, but about 1985. I was on a plane and flying with a guy and he was using his cell phone and they could tell in the cockpit that he was on, on his cell phone. And they sent the stewardess back two or three times to tell him to turn the darn thing off finally before he, he turned it off, but they could tell. Wow. I mean, and it, and it made a difference, right? But then you fast forward to 2000, uh, 2000 to nine 11, right? And, and here at nine 11, you have, you have the passengers in the craft on the phone for hours and it wasn't a problem. And, and the remarkable thing is, is it's cruising at altitude and it's, I mean, it's hint, it's hint, the base stations are handing the phone off from tower to tower to tower as that plane is flying 500 miles an hour, which the cell, the, the cell network was never designed to do. So, you know, what a difference it makes from 85 to nine 11, right? Yep. Yeah, I think they said it interfered with the um, altimeter primarily. They can't tell how far the ground is below them. I, I, I'm sure anything that's not hardened for it. I mean, having having done uh, EMC hardened equipment for the defense industry, you got radiated, you got conducted susceptibility, and standard engineering, right? Is it a problem? Well, it just depends. Are the spurs on your radio at exactly the wrong place for the sensitivity and susceptibility on on this box or that box, and that's why that's why the, to my view, FAA is so conservative, and that's why they were so concerned about it. And the FCC, they're probably looking at um, like roll off, and they're saying, "Well, come on, guys! According to the specs, this should work." So time will tell, right? The thing I learned in the one uh, avionics related class was the they're saying uh, the saying is that much regulation is written in blood. So it, at least they've reached some compromise where the, the biggest issues seem to be around the major hub airports. And, uh, and if I've heard right, then uh, they're not going to deploy 5G within a couple miles of the big airports. So I guess they're going to let it run. We'll see. So you're perfectly safe when you're flying into a small airport. Oh, right? it's no problem. Yeah. <laughs> but not DFW. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I think maybe it had to do with, um, yeah, I don't know how close those are to, you know, the DFW airport. I mean, it's a huge complex, but, you know, you've got, what, Irving, um, Las Colinas, oh, that's Capel, huge. Oh, yeah. you know, I mean, and those are pretty heavily populated areas. So are you going to deny them cell phone use for? Well, you're going to deny yeah. them whatever benefits of 5G. and. And I suspect that, you know, there's going to be, I mean, 5G is not just this single homogeneous thing, right? It's this, it's, I, I believe it's this, uh, it, it's a bunch of different pieces of spectrum and how they relate to each other. So I, I'm willing to bet that if, if they, uh, and the FCC and the FAA, I mean, they understand where the, the guard bands overlap or they're a little more narrow than they want. So I suspect that they, sh they should be able to just like, disable they could probably find a way to just disable those channels that are the most trouble so rather than cut off the whole the whole bandwidth of a certain channel just cut off that part that 
who knows? Mm. Who knows how it's spec and how what they'll do? But I think we're all just guessing, and I'm the worst guesser at the moment. So, so I should shut up. Um, which takes us to our next one in line. I think we had Doug. You had something, then Ray, and then whoever wants to go after Ray. I think I put Doug P to sleep, or he's muted. He's muted. Oh, I scared him off. I saw his camera go off. I think he probably had to step out for a minute. Why don't you let Ray go first? Okay. Oh, I just was, you know, kind of, I guess I kind of butted in line here. Excuse me. Um, with the CNC stuff, I, you know, I was thinking I could do one of the monthly presentations if there was enough interest for it. But it sounds like, yeah, there's a handful of us that are kind of interested in it, but. So I let you guys determine whether you want to see that. Now, I was just going to do, you know, kind of the progress of, you know, starting out with a mill that looked like it had a lot of issues to getting it working again and then looking at all the different options there are for, you know, replacing basically uh, or doing an, an upgrade to a 35-year-old or the electronics of a 35-year-old mill. So. Well, I would I would say that it, it, would anybody on the call object to such a presentation? No. no I, okay. You've got support, Ray. We're up for a good story. So I, I'll put you on the list uh, with Jack, and we can figure out a time at some point. Okay. Whoever's, whoever's managing that. Okay. I'll take a quick um, note at this lull to say that I've had a job change, which means that I normally will be working on Wednesdays now. So um, I probably won't be able to get into these meetings very often. Today I'm going to have to leave probably right now and get back to work. Um, so apologies. Um, new job, change of life circumstance, etc. cetera. But um, uh, yeah, I'll try to get in I can. So. Well, hopefully it's all for the better. And and if there's anything we can do for you, Ray, any, we, I mean, uh, Murray, we still got the the, the Discord, uh, yep. that's not going anywhere, right? So well, the job is an improvement, although I have to work on Windows, which is a pain. But um, sorry. <laughs> but anyway, I I got to run. So Smallest take care. Smallest violin in the world. Smallest violin in the world, right there. Thanks for dropping in. Yeah, we'll see you guys. <laughs> take care, Murray. Smallest violin played by the Microsoft MVP on the call. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> All right, Doug, it looks like you have returned. So uh, would you like to jump in? I just have a small thing. Uh, this is my backup APM auto, uh, pilot that, that I have, you know, on my Rover. And one of the things that I put down in my wants to do this year was to start getting it so that I can load the, the waypoints and all of the get the program started remotely without using another computer. All right, so I have made some progress on the Mavlink library. And uh, now I am can transfer uh, coordinates from the mega to, you know, GPS coordinates from the mega to, to the, um, the autopilot. And so I can set the waypoints. So anyway, anyways, it's a small progress, but it means I'm starting to dig in on my Rover again. So I'm pretty excited about it. I'm hoping to be able to show, uh, uh something similar to what you did, Carl. Uh, but, uh, uh, it, we'll see, you know, I want to be able to do it where it's completely doesn't have to have another PC there. Yeah. And the real problem with this is, is yes, I can now, uh, somehow I have to, it's still easier to say if we were in the com competition environment to be at my little desk and just transfer the, transfer the, uh, the waypoints because we have them, you know, we've, we've found that where the cones are. But the one thing that's not uh, so easy is to make sure that the, that it actually, so now you've got your robot all 
has the loaded waypoints, but now you go over to the first, the starting line is to get it to make sure that it kicks in correctly. And that's what I'm working on now and I made some progress. So I'm just kind of excited. I know it's not very, not very sexy, but hey, you know, it works. I guess I could show, I could show you the output from the serial port, but that's not very sexy either. So, yeah, progress. That's cool. Yeah, progress. Cool. All right. Have you heard? Mm. You said that's the APM you're running. This. Uh, yeah, that's the real antique. Uh, the you can pilot? still get them. You can still get them. Uh, the Audi Pilot, right? They're based off of Omega. The new ones are called Pickoxes, and they're based off of STF thirty F thirty twos. So, uh, you know, if I if I had nothing, I would just go get a Pickox. They're much more expensive, though. These you can pick up these. I think I don't I don't know what they're selling for now, but not very much. But they never stop making them over in China. They just keep punching them out. And the, the main difference between them and the uh, Pickox is the Pickox uses a true Kalman filter. These use a complementary filter, but you know I, I've been able to, you know, several years ago I set up some uh, waypoints in the the makerspace parking lot that were very far, you know, were a hundred yards apart, and it drove to them with no problem at all. So that's not, you know, that's not a. I'm sure the other ones are probably more precise, but that's not what we're trying to do here. We're trying to get close enough so that our cameras can pick it up. And that's one of the next things I want to do is, and this is something I could learn, would like to, anybody finds a good, good reference on it to let me know, is getting the training pictures for, for the model. It's, when I look at, uh, at different uh, examples on the, the web, they're, they're, they're not real clear that they, uh, on exactly how they get them pre-processed to the right size and how they center it. Do they, do they need to have like blank backgrounds or do they have random black backgrounds or, you know, I don't know exactly what they, how to prepare my, my image data set. Uh, the first thing I want to try is, uh, what is it, a Haas Cascade, that I believe is what it's called. And, hair. Uh, huh? I think it's Hair Cascade. Hair Cascade, okay. And Chris, Chris would be able to tell us. It's, uh, yeah, it sounds German, yeah. I think. Yeah, but anyway, it's uh, there's a guy out on YouTube that actually did that already for for uh, for orange clones so that's uh i'd like to follow in his footsteps here in the next month or so and see if i could get something that way i have probably I, i'm not exactly sure how i would do this i would either use two cameras one running the hask cascade and the other one running a blob detector and use them to to set, find the cone and make sure it's everything is cool. Anyway, that's what I'm I'm where I'm going. But first of all, I got to get the where the autopilot kicks off by itself to make sure without any other intervention. You know, I just want to go over and push a button and it off it goes. So we'll see how it goes. Cool. Harold, what, what did you do? You were trying to like do some training with cones and not cones, right? Did you? Yeah, I, I'm, you know, Microsoft MVP, right? So mm -hmm. I went to Azure Cognitive Services. I'm using their custom vision and I've got some, I don't, I'm not prepared to show it to get them. I forget where all the URLs are, but um, I use their, if you go to Azure Cognitive Services and look up custom vision, um, basically what you do on that is you get so much free time per month for training and you just start, uh, 
you whatever pictures you have as far as backgrounds and all that kind of stuff whatever kind of the different ones you want um what we ended up doing and i can't tell you whether it's good or bad but it seemed to be better than not with the amount of effort we had to put into it um is that i took a bunch of pictures out in the bright sun with the cone in different situations like ones like next to a, a fire hydrant some other stuff in the grass and some in the middle of the parking lot and that kind of stuff one of my stream members grabbed all those made them black and white okay so we took the two sets made them black and white and also made had the full color ones and then i went and ran a bunch of uh just uh cone images uh graphics and that kind of stuff through it and ran and then you have to go through each picture there and it got smarter as we would i think it got smarter seemed to get smarter don't know that it did maybe i was just <laughs> dreaming that as i was what you have to do to every one of those images you'll draw a bounding box around the thing yeah. that you want to find and put a label on it and then once you do all of that you can hit the train button and and of course that takes however many minutes hours or whatever on those different things and then once you put all those stuff together you'll come out with a model and what i was doing with the model was just using it inside of the uh the uh, environment they had but you could certainly download that model into a uh into a docker container that run in python that fires up a bit of web server and basically it's sitting there waiting for you to sh shoot image bits at it and they'll send you json back with bounding boxes of things that it found in the confidence center it's pretty slick. I couldn't use it on my robot because I was in DLL version hell of three kind of versions of Python and things didn't want to work right and a bunch of other stuff, which is why I'm doing my Ross 2 thing on my stream now. I'm playing around with that. But but that's what I did. Yeah. And everybody has a number. There is a free tier where you get like, I don't know, an hour of training on a monthly basis. And I don't know that I used a whole hour when I was training on mine. And then you, then you have a model and you can download the Docker thing or you can download just the model and put it in your own cell. There's a few ways to do that. It seemed pretty cool. Now, is it accurate enough? Is it gonna do well in the real world? I haven't tried that yet. Mm -hmm. Now the guy on the YouTube video, what he did is he wrote a Python script that essentially captures the video screen. Well, actually I think he just turned it up turns on his video camera and lets it run for a while as he drives the robot around, okay? Show you with the cone in cone in view. You know what I mean? So he's getting different different views. And then then he removes the cone and then he pretty much does the same thing. All right. And that's his no cone set. So uh but you know I, I don't know what he how he I don't know like uh what size picture he put it to and i do think he had to he had to do what harold just mentioned about so he pulls out all all the cone pictures that he has from his video feed mm -hmm. and then somehow i want to say he he had some some semi-automatic way to do the bounding box and that's so because that that looked like I will tell you, as I, as I was planning, as I was playing with this tool, as I would get a new picture, it sometimes made a good guess what the bounding boxes is. So I didn't have to adjust it very much. I just had to make sure I had the right label on it mm -hmm. as I was going through. I was um, I'm like, wow, I did it do that on purpose or did it make just a guess or I don't know, but I'm taking it, you know. That kind yeah. Of yeah. Well, so we're going to see how it, yeah. Because I think what the program really wants is the opposite corners or something like that of the rectangle, mm -hmm. and whether it's and and where what if it's a cone or not, or if you have multiple classes, you know what else is it? So we'll see. But uh, if I can if I can figure out how to get the data in, I think the next step is a little easier. Uh, so. I don't mind it. You know, I can dedicate a machine and just let it run in a corner and take days if it wants to. But uh, there's apparently a point where, uh, if I understood them correctly, you want it where if you're, if you're doing a, a deep learning, I mean, a machine learning 
algorithm. You want the uh, you want to use enough epochs where it goes down through and gets closer and closer, but you don't want to keep running it after it's kind of stopped converging because you'll overtrain the model, and then then that actually works against you. So yeah, that was that was part of that uh, that that IDE and the training and stuff. Yeah, you could tell it, and it would, and you could set some parameters to say train until you get good enough, or you run out of money. Yeah, you know, and, and and what what does good enough mean? You know, that sort of thing. Yeah, and uh, and that overtraining was a big deal because it would certainly watch for that and let you know that you overtrain. There was some indicator that um, it was going up and up and up and up and up, and then now you're coming back down. So right here was your sweet spot. So don't worry about these. That yeah. it, would, it would help you make that decision. Yeah where that was so yeah, i bought a couple of cones to try to train my jets and nano to mm -hmm. identify them i gave up on day three that's why i didn't submit anything i just completely just walked away from it oh. i just didn't have time to come back to it so i'd love to finish that at some point yeah but that was a massive pain god it was horrible mm -hmm. well like i say this I'm going to try this guy's idea uh, and like I say, just put the cone out in where the field or wherever you want it to be and you just run your robot around and it's continuously taking video. So uh, that's uh, then you just pick out all the ones you look at the video and you pick out the sections that the frames that have a cone in it. And uh, that's how you get your starting data set and then after you have that then you gotta do you got to resize the image and then you have to find the bounding boxes of the cones in the image so uh it is it, it, preparing the data set looks like it, it is pretty painful but hey you know that'd be cool another approach yeah Okay, cool. Uh, I think we didn't have anyone in queue yet formally after Doug uh, P. But Doug D, you've been holding up a, not to put you out, call you out, but you've been holding up a fancy new toy there. You want to talk about it? You're muted, though. Still muted. Still muted. All right, there, you go. there we go. So it looks like the Emperor Dark Sidious or something. <laughs> I got there. I got this RC car and I managed to get the cover off. Pretty simple. I'm trying to get into this plastic piece here, which you may have been watching me taking screws out and pulling on things and trying to get it apart. I'm trying to get into the electronics so that I can turn it into an autonomous car. And I'm having a lot of trouble getting into where the electronics are. I may just give it to a boy and say, here's a good RC car I put. <laughs> So do you get it at Walmart? I saw that they had it for $25. Yeah, I got that off on Amazon. Well. Yeah, not like that. That's it's, too it's big. It's got really good uh, well, wheels, suspension and shocks, and, and, it, and it's uh, watertight. It runs through water and everything, although if I break mm -hmm. into the electronics to, to hook into it, I don't know if it'll stay watertight. But uh, I'm about to give up on it. I'm putting the screws back into it that I've taken out because I'm tired of trying to pull this frame off so I can get to the electronics. Where, Maybe another day. Where are the electronics in there? Can you? Well, you you know, probably go through the bottom, wouldn't you? I have this gun here that transmits signal. On the bottom, there's a battery pack. Is the only opening thing here. This appears to be some motor stuff for the, the wheels turning and things. Yeah. Here's some more motor stuff. And the electronics may be in there. I haven't taken those screws out to look and see what's in there. No, they're, they're not in the motor. They're not in the motor areas. They're, it's it going to be, like there's a gonna be, uh, be there's behind a, the battery. There's an RPI box here behind the R, the batteries that yeah. I can't find a way to get into. There's no screws that opens that up from anywhere I can see. There's a wire going into it from both sides. So clearly there's electronics in there. I'm mm -hmm. just about to give up on it for the next couple of days. I've been goofing off on robots and working on my my uh, contract work, so I haven't gotten much robot stuff done lately. I was hoping this would 
get me rolling again, I'm probably just going to go back to my prototype, which thanks once again, Harold, for giving me my prototype robot. <laughs> and no I'm going to get that one going so I can put this, uh, this telepresence robot thing to bed for a while because I still want to get back to my other projects which I originally was going to start on. So that's it. Cool. Oh. Well, some of us have to I have me. something to show for you got Ray. Since I was surfing the red, I found this thing, which is right up your alley, I think. It's a baby version. Okay. So hopefully you're seeing it. Yeah, you are good. So, um, so here's a baby 3d printed lawnmower ray <laughs> as you can see because it has to be small based on the fact that <laughs> it's with 3d printed all parts of it i thought it was interesting that how they did the body and then the reels there i don't know if they actually show uh, the parts uh, okay they have a hot well, okay and it's well dominant though, so so but you can see um, so they use the, the worm gear basically, you know, the twelve volt worm gear in your windows. So that's gives you an idea of roughly the size of this thing based on that the worm gear more than that house in there. So and you can see they have a pretty well layout on that. So are they using a, a weed eater string? Uh, no, they use 30 pieces of <laughs> lawnmower play. <laughs> 30 pieces. 30 pieces. That size. <laughs> you know, those little hub things like on weed eaters, okay. basically. Oh, yeah. So, so it is like a weed... Uh... It's not using the nylon filament. It's using the the many small short blades. Right. Hmm. Yeah. So yeah, I thought that was interesting, though. You know, they have all the different parts and that. Yeah, I don't think the blades are rigidly fixed. The the screw no, that they, holds them on, right. they can spin around that screw. Oh yeah, and the racket sort of. But it's yeah. a nice small one. So. <laughs> Centrifugal force, I think, keeps the blades out. Do they have a video of it running at all? I don't think so. Let's see if I can find a video on it. Uh, so I wonder how many days it would cost uh, take running 24-7 to cut Ray's lawn. Yeah, I was thinking that too. <laughs> so how, how many acres per day can it cut? <laughs> there you go. Point zero 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 one. <laughs> okay. And, and what I'm happens gonna... when it hits a cow turd? Oh you know? god! <laughs> it just falls over. Yeah. When it's small enough, it may bump into it. You're right. <laughs> nope, they don't. Well, nope. So that was an interest. And then the other thing I saw, which is not directly to the lawnmower, but I like the way the module built this thing. So this is the other one that's of interest because you can see they basically have panels and then it goes up along those rails. So I thought that Does was- Does it extend up on that? You can see, yeah. That you see where they have a little module that basically slides into the whale. And then you have this piece and you just, so one good. layer is where the belt is and then the motor's above. I thought that was sort of interesting. And then you can see the top. Hmm. Let me, yeah, see, there's more, and then there's a reel, and then they have a belt between the two. So that's sort of interesting belt. Yeah, it's like an R3D3. Like, yeah, that's what I was say. It almost looks like a Star Wars, Star Wars droid. Yeah, so that's sort of cute. But it's not as well documented in my mind. My cannon wheels. Or something. Yeah. I mean, they have that. Maybe it's semi. Yeah, okay. I guess it has where all the parts are. But yeah, the two 
things of interest, and I especially <laughs> thought the real, yeah, the little uh, lawnmower robot was cute because it was, uh, but it was cute. Mm -hmm. And then for people out in the snow, there's actually this one out there. I don't know how well that would do on regular ground, though. I'm thinking not because it has basically the little screw. Huh. Augers, yeah. Augers. I don't know if there's a big on this one. Oh, there actually might be. Popular yeah. with our friends up north, eh? <laughs> uh, do they have a video? Nope. Auger wheels. That's, that's, that's yeah, cool. It's getting kind there of tools to burn. So, I had one a couple of years back. I think Mattel or somebody had one like that as a toy. And I was not impressed with it overall. But the Russians know, he... seem to love this. I've I've seen videos of you know one the size that a man could sit on, and it was amphibious. It could actually go through mm -hmm. water, and um, so I don't I don't know why they like this particular design, but they seem to. I could see it working in snow. Yep. But... Anything that's a hard, tough ground, I don't think will. Looks like it could crab crawl too. Yeah, I noticed it gets the nudge. <laughs> well, you come through that deep of snow, maybe. The Russian boot. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> oh. Well, that was of interest. Thanks, John. Yep. Okay, looking around, who else has uh, got something they'd like to share? I can talk a little bit. I can talk did, did, Mike, did Michael raise his hand I, there? Yeah, I wrote up my hand here. Mike has a hand and then Rudd. So does that work, Mike, then Rudd? Okay. You, want, you want me to go first? Yeah. Um, Y'all seen that claw machine I made? Yeah. Oh, y'all. I'm going to make another one out of, you know, you, I've probably seen this on eBay or something. But this is just going to be my little practice. Anyway, I'm going to make another claw machine with with an arm, with a robot arm. And it's going to, it's for, for Halloween, you know, like, like John was making that Halloween deal is I make these, uh, Call machine, it'll be for Halloween carnival. You know, I'm gonna start messing with this, making a big one. You know, it's gonna be kind of like that. Uh, to, to do like a claw machine does, except that the claw here on the end, on the on the end, I'm gonna make it with a string where it drops down like a regular claw machine, but it's gonna rotate 180 degrees. And then the kids can operate it coming in and out and then rotate around. I'm also going to put a little laser light that shines down at the at the the, the the target, so that they can kind of see that one of them real harmless lasers. And uh, but the claw's going to drop on a string, like you would see at a regular claw machine. So anyway, that's a project I'm going to start this year. So I got that. Cool. I, I don't have anything. I might even put some eyes on it, like John, you know, <laughs> looking around like this. I was I was impressed with those eyes. So anyway, that's what I got. I'm gonna start that and I'll show you my progress as the year goes by. Okay. Cool. Thanks, Michael. Uh so Red, what'd you got? Nothing special. Oh. Came in the mail today. It was a Raspberry Pi four. Four B. Mm -hmm. Haven't had a chance to try it yet, but they they can be found. <laughs> cool. Did you get some cooling uh, option with it? I'm sorry. Are you, are you gonna run it bare, or did you get some fan or something to cool it? I I, I did get a, a heat sink for it, so I don't know that I actually need that, but we'll see. Okay. Those things get pretty hot. I got fans and heat sinks on all of mine, but that's yeah. just me probably being an over a little bit of overkill, but. What I found was is that they will throw, you won't burn it up, but they will throttle themselves. So depending on what you're doing, and it feels sluggish to you, 
uh, throw a fan on, you know, go and put the heat sinks on. And then if it feels sluggish to you and that kind of stuff, get a fan blowing across it. See if your speed doesn't pick up. Because they will throttle themselves. Do. Cool. Well, wish, and what are you going to do with that pie, Rod? Do you have a project in mind? Well, it's going to go on my rover. I've been using a, a 3V plus or whatever it is. And I just figured I'd need a little bit more horsepower. So I'll put the plug in. More mips. So I can get the four and put it on there. Mm -hmm. Cool. And Pat, what do you got to show? I got a couple of Palulu gear motors that came in. Ooh hoo. So I'm changing my gear ratio from 50 to 1 to 131 to 1. And that's to try to give me a little better control when I'm uh, steering, starting, stopping, steering. So I got the motors changed out today, but I'm working on uh, trying to retune all my PID loops. Cool. Rudd, did you get the 8 gig? 4B, or did you get the 4 gig or the 2 gig? It's a 2 gig. That's the only thing I, they had available. So okay. it was from A to Fruit. Gotcha. So, Pat, uh, one, you know, what size motor? So 37D, 12 volt. And in, in the, in the ratio was what? The 130? 131 to 1. Okay. Wow. So what's top speed? Uh, right now I was testing it. I'm running at uh, at uh, top top speed. I'm running at is manual was thirty centimeters per second, which is about a foot per second. Okay. Uh, and probably autonomously, I think it's going to be dropped to half of that to about. Yeah. 15 centimeters per second. Mm -hmm. Why did you change to such, I mean, you were much lower than that, right? Because you I, were- I was 50 to one. Yeah. And But the pro problem I was getting is when I drop down to 15 centimeters per second, yeah. I'm not getting a lot of counts uh, on my encoder. And I was right at the bottom end of the motor. I was like below 10% of my motor speed. Okay. So I wanted to get back into more in the 50% range on my motor speed. So I think with this, I'll be in the 35 or 40, just over 40% motor speed. But you never had any power issues. No, well, what I was having is, um, it's, I couldn't get it tuned to run that slow that it would overshoot all the time. It would eventually the, the PID loop would overshoot a little bit and it would go too far. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I mean, but you're, so, you're going to have a lot more torque than you used to have. Yeah, but I, I had no, to, at the at the 15 or 30 centimeters per second, I wasn't having a, an issue. It's when I was, when I was stopped and turning slowly, that's when I was having the issue, when I was spinning on the spot. Okay. So when it, so I, I didn't want to uh, turn too fast and I'd end up, because I'm lower than, I think I was down to five or uh, five or 10, 15 centimeters per second mm -hmm. in uh, with, with no velocity and just uh, rotational velocity. Mm -hmm. And I would end up overshooting. So it would do something like this. Yeah. Um, it, it would go past, then it would try to go correct the other way, go a little farther and eventually turn the wrong direction and start hunting again. <laughs> okay. Mm. So I wanted to get the motor speed up a little bit better so that I, mm -hmm. I'm in, more in control. Mm -hmm. Did you, um, are you using the good, 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 bad technique? I think Ron was mentioned it the, uh, when the last time he was on, you know, where you're, you're closer, you're closer, you're closer, you're closer. I'm past it, and then it stops. I'm just curious. How did you, how did you 
I mean, that's what I was doing is I'm closer and closer and closer and past and I stop. And so, um, I'm looking at putting in the third PID loop, Mm -hmm. um, for the heading. Cause that way you don't have, when you, unless you're not going to go any further, you're just trying to point your your robot. You know, if you're trying to go to another waypoint, you don't have to be exactly accurate at this turning point. Okay. You know, you understand what I'm saying? Yeah. Because you're going to move to the other waypoint. You, your PIDs are going to correct, and you're going to be pointing the right direction. But it might not. You know, if you if you're a little off at, at the turn, it's not necessarily the end of the world. Okay. When you unless doing- you you know unless you got to do it if that's part of the what you're trying to do. You know, if you're saying I'm going to stop and I'm going to go face exactly this direction. No, what I'm trying to avoid doing. Okay. So I'd like to say I'm going to I it's a it's a sharp angle, so I'm going to spin in place. Yeah. Uh, but if it's not a sharp angle uh, and I'm you know I'm in the general direction, the idea would be to use like a PID loop to correct it and while I'm moving in a forward direction. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Okay, cool. Hey, Chris, I, I'm sorry, uh, Pat. Um, we had a exchange on the on the list, and thanks for your explanation about why you stepped away from the uh, pulse width measurement technique for odometry and dealing with low counts. And Doug also uh, suggested that I um, use pulse width measurement um, to deal with the low and enco- low rate of encoder counts on mobile. Um, and but what you said was uh, you couldn't figure out how to deal with um, with the pulse width when the robot stopped, and uh, or what to do with about velocity or, or speed, I should say, when it stops counting. And so I, I, I'll just throw this out, and I don't know whether it'll work or not. But um, I was imagining that I because because Mobot has very few counts um, per wheel distance of wheel uh, motion. What I thought I'd do is. If I don't see any uh, transitions on the encoder within um, some timeout, then I'd declare speed to be zero. And um, then you have to deal with what happens with the first transition um, when it starts moving again. Or maybe it's not really stopped, it's just going super slowly, um, but you get a you get a transition. And I think in that case, you can't raise speed, you can't get speed above zero until you get the next pulse that's within the timeout. So so that's what that's what I was thinking. I don't know if you thought about that and whether you have any know any reasons why that wouldn't work. No, that was where that was where I gave up on it essentially. Um Exactly there what you're talking about. You need two pulses to know a speed. So going from zero to a first pulse does not give you a speed. So now your first encoder tick is essentially wasted until you get a second encoder tick. And you can calculate it. And it became arbitrarily, okay, what's the value that I'm gonna say I don't have a pulse? So if you're getting, you know, two ticks as you're moving forward uh, at normal speed it could be quite a while before you say, Hey, I'm stopped where you're, you know, you're actually still moving. Um, and I was doing the same thing. I had a a homemade encoder I made out of a tin can. So I cut a bunch of uh, teeth in the end of the tin can and I had a photo optic sensor and I was counting pulses. And similarly, I had 32 pulses per revolution on a wheel. And it's uh, that's what uh, was giving me trouble. And I ended up switching to a motor with an uh, with an encoder built in. Uh, for, for one of the other reasons was noise. I was using a Bainbots planetary gearbox, and they, they were exceptionally noisy. Yeah, no, yeah. You mentioned noise, and that's certainly if you got noise, then that's that's a problem. You get yeah, that, that's 
that's that's a reason to change something. Yeah, but, I put the new motors on the robot tonight, and I just spun them up, and I'm not impressed with the noise level, the sound level as well. The 50 to 1 gear ratio was very much quieter. Um, so uh, just to just one point of clarification, um, it, you, you said correctly that you got to have two pulses or, or two transitions to be able to calculate speed. But one transition does tell you that you move. So I think you got to accumulate distance and speed separately. So if you got a, like a real slow pulse rate that, that is climbing out and, and speed keeps on at zero, you still need to keep distance incrementing so that you can compute any changes in uh, heading. Yeah, that's typically I do two encoder counts for each of my encoders. So one of them is uh, just an incremental count. Every time I see a tick, I increment my encoder up. The other one is uh, I, when I see a tick, I either increment it up or down on a separate uh, counter. Um, so I can, I can track direction with one and basically the other one just gives me a reference for, you can use it for anything, speed, whatever. Thanks. You're, you're using... In Arduino land, if you're using pulse in, it does have a timeout field. I don't usually use it, but. But pulse in is blocking, is it not? I don't know. I'd have to look it up. So that's, uh, I, I was using interrupts. I was using actually uh, uh, <coughs> pin change interrupt, which is a software routine. Yeah. Um, yeah, I like doing that too. I think it works much better. Yeah, and I, I'm doing it right now. I'm using pin change interrupt, um, and I'm monitoring all four encoder pins. Yeah. Yeah. Earlier, I was confusing foot pounds and inch pounds. It actually turns out it's forty inch pounds. Um, let me see if I can quickly grab the thing. Paul, if you get this uh, going, I. Be curious to see your code. Yeah. Um, that's uh, like next up to, to work on. I've been uh, I've been um, building new electronics to adapt the ESP 32s 3.3 volt inputs to the Mo to Mobox 5 volt uh, input. So level translators on a proto board, and that's pretty much get me busy for the week. But yeah, yeah, I'm about to uh, about to start on the software for that. Yeah, even in if it's just a uh, like in, not into code, just pseudocode would be fine. How do you do it? How do you track it? And uh, how do you you expunge the value back to zero when you think you're stopped? That sort of thing. That's the problems I ran into. That was my that's why I gave up on it and the noise issue. I think I know how I'm going to do that. Do all that. It, it's not coded yet, but um, I'm figuring on using the uh, using the RTOS on the on the ESP32 and putting the tick count from uh, at the interrupt level into a queue down to the odometer task um, at at the base level. So. I should say the delta tick tick count. I should say so. Friatos has this internal count of ticks that runs at a one millisecond rate, um, and it's it's the same as it's like millis, but it doesn't have all of the quirks that Doug pointed out in his email um, about interrupt getting interrupted while you're trying to read millis and so forth. Um, so I think I think I can just um, read read um, the the tick counter in Priatos and put in a queue down to the base task, and then the base task can suck off as many of them, and it has a uh, wait on queue with timeout um, 
function that you know after the timeout, which I thought so the the peak tick rate or peak peak transition rate on Mobot is 12 milliseconds at 100% speed. So quarter speed would be uh, 48 milliseconds. So I figured if it times out, if I time it out in 50 milliseconds, then it's going at under quarter speed. And, and considering full speed is one mile an hour, I think quarter, quarter of a mile an hour is a, is a reasonable bottom limit for uh, a speed that I, a low speed control, control limit. So I think that's where I'd time it out. And, uh, and then if there are no ticks in the queue, by the time it times out, then um, call it zero speed. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I'm a little confused when you, I mean, I guess you do technically need two, two, and two ticks to have a beginning of a period and end of a period, but you're really measuring the number of wherever your high speed clock is, whatever it is, you know, you're just numbering, you you have like a, your first tick gives you the start and then the second one gives you the stop and you, whatever that counters, counters register is, is going to be your, uh, you know, your time period. So I would think that if you never, if you, you know, that just setting a, a max value that that counter could be, so you could say, okay, if I don't, in the in the interrupt you basically well i guess that would not you'd have to set you might have to use two channels you know where you have two values so that like this your first ticket you start it then then you look for the counter value that's either that start value plus some number and uh then it would uh if it doesn't if it sees that number if it if the key doesn't see that number, then it would interrupt. I think you're overthinking it, Doug. I think all you got to do is whenever you get a transition, you you stick the current time count into the queue, and then you let the base uh, routine read them out, and it will read out some string of values of of timestamps yeah. when transitions happen, and whatever the last dip the le last difference between the most recent two timestamps is the speed at that last measurement. Uh, wait a minute. Okay. All right. Because, you know, you're looping around every, what, 20 milliseconds or you said 48. I can't remember what you were telling me. It's some big number. Your, your, your process loop. Yeah. So surely you, if you're, get at least two ticks in that total process loop. Yeah. If you don't, then you're stopped. Right. Right. That, that's exactly what I'm saying. Okay. All right. Okay. I guess yeah, when you're going so slow, it's like you're stopped. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. You could also use uh, your output power to your motor. So if you're outputting zero to the motor and you haven't seen a tick in a timeout period to, to confirm you're stopped, basically. I never thought of doing that. Yeah, it's not foolproof, though, because the wheels might be stuck. Yeah. Well, if the wheels are stuck, they're still spinning, unless they're jammed. Will they be jammed? Yeah. I'm saying if yeah. it's low power, they may not have enough power to move. Yeah. I know that tonight I hit the uh, the the railing in the hallway here with my robot, and the timing belt just started to the drive belt just started to jump. Ooh. So there's lots of power there. Pat, on the bottom side of your robot, did you just use like pillow blocks to hold your yeah. axle? Yeah, I did. Hang on. See if I can switch that. 
to give you a view. Uh, settings, video. Uh huh. So I don't know if you can see that. Mm -hmm. uh, I ran out of ca camera cable. Yep. Yep. So I've switched my motors around. The, 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 the sprockets used to be facing each other, and it gives me problems to try to remove the bolts off the bracket. So, so you flipped them around. I flipped them around, and what I didn't like is the pillow blocks in the bottom. I had to, um, they're actually, I had to move them in a little wee bit. So I've got long, a longer shaft out to my wheels, but it's eight millimeter uh, steel. Uh, it's a printer shaft essentially for a 3D printer. Hmm. And yep. it doesn't seem to flex, it's pretty good. So that, that's what I was working on today. So now I'm trying to retune all my PID loops and then see if I can get a PID on my heading working. Oh boy, a discussion about PID tuning. <laughs> PID tuning, yes. How exciting. So that's that's uh, today's uh, dilemma. Cool. Hey, well, it looks like good progress. Um, I have I have something to share that just came in. Uh, while we were chatting. And uh, so next Wednesday, apparently, uh, CMU does these regular dialogues. And uh, next Wednesday, they're going to have a, uh, what else? Uh, building Robotics for Everyday Life, they've called it. Uh, you got to sign up by next Tuesday. But it's, I guess, uh, bringing robots in everyday life. Um, safe and comfortable for direct interaction with people. So it's a panel discussion of how research is creating small, soft, and bio-interfacing machines to bring robots into households, workplaces, hospitals, and the natural world. So uh, I can send this link into the chat for anybody that's interested. Okay, cool. So do they have some for the unnatural world? <laughs> You're called robots in hell. <laughs> I I think it's too hard to get robots to take care of, of people, and I think that eventually your boss will be replaced by a robot, so that you and your dexterity and your good vision can be forced to work harder. <laughs> the robots will be our overlords. <laughs> Absolutely. Got it. Okay. All right. Um, all right. Checking around the table. Anyone else have some things to bring up tonight? We're all just so oh, tired. So tired. I'm not can, I can talk a little. Imagine that I can talk a little bit. Oh, 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 oh that's, that's, that's an understatement. What do you got, Harold? <laughs> uh, not not just a not just a heck of a lot. I had some um, pretty good success on my stream uh, the last few few times i've got a raspberry pi where i'm you know i've got i want to get ross 2 up and going again and had some false starting and things and that kind of stuff but uh um, i'm walking through it i'm making a uh documentation and stuff as we go and so i've got a raspberry pi i've got a ubuntu on it i can run a couple of docker containers that can talk and then i've got the windows of my laptop that can talk and the next stream uh, the goal is to uh, have a Docker container running on the Raspberry Pi and then have the uh, uh, Ross 2 thing, Ross 2 up and running on the on the laptop. So we're connecting over the network and doing those sorts of things. I learned a long time ago that because um, uh, I, I, I made a whole bunch of stuff work and then I try to connect it to the internet, connect, not to the internet, but they connect across things and setting up my device my development environment and that was just the uh, absolutely wrong way to go about that because i didn't know whether i was causing a problem or, 
before the networking thing was a problem. I don't know which one was the problem, and you don't know where the problem is. And so, um, we're I'm I'm, I'm taking it uh, fairly fairly slow step on that, and I'm having a lot of good fun with that. And people are coming and seeing my stream, and and uh, so and a lot of them are helping out. We solved a few problems over the stream. Like, hey, why don't you try this? Well, heck, that worked. Okay, we're doing that now. You know that kind of stuff. It's, it's lots of fun. And, um, and one of the things, um, that just came out of it, I don't, I don't have a link cause it's, I don't have it up on the other machine on it, but I talked to Lou Amadio. He's come and talked to this group before and he's got some videos that, um, he's starting to do a thing where, uh, he's using visual studio code and Ross as a Ross extension for it to do it. And I think probably part of his group has some of that. So as I find some of that stuff out, I'll forward it onto this group as well. And um, and let's see what else on the whole thing. Uh, not just a whole lot, actually. I'm trying to do stuff at work. I'm my day job involves Raspberry Pis and RFIDs and million square foot warehouses, which we're not sure how that's going to work yet. But uh, it, you know, it's going to be. There's been there's some fun things there. So and uh, yeah, so that's about that's about it for me. Going all this thing, I just wanted to talk about the. The Ross 2, I'm not prepared to give a Ross 2 intro by any means on the thing. Um, but, and I'm not so sure that I would recommend everybody do Ross 2 because Ross 1 is much more prevalent. In fact, one of the things where I got my head beat in the sand with, um, if I want a Docker container running on Raspberry Pi OS, running Ross 1, they've got all kinds of Docker containers. I pull it and I'm up in just a few minutes, well, however long it takes to come down. Ross two, not so much. Um, I'm I'm building a. Uh, I've got a, some stuff up on the Docker Hub now. When I get done with it, it'll be available. Whoever wants to pull it, but it'll just be a base Ross two installation for Galactic, which is the the latest uh, uh, release they've got going out there. For anybody who's interested, I think uh, somebody poked me on the. Uh, I forget who was it, Karim Kumar. I think it's Kumar. Ask this. I said, hey, you know, I'm still building the thing. The instructions up. Here's the GitHub link. Here's the instructions are up there so far. You can try building it yourself on the thing and uh, let me know. And we're kind of just working through the progress process. It's actually kind of cool um, doing it and doing these things step by step and kind of figuring out uh, how we're going along and, and making it happen. It's, yeah, it's way cooler than I thought it was going to be. But, uh, you know, I don't have a robot that runs, so I don't, I don't get a star. So, but. I got a Raspberry Pi that, that turns on, so I'm not looking to get a star at the moment. But uh, uh, this is cool. And Doug, um, which Doug? Doug D. I was really hoping you could get that uh, car apart and look at it because uh, I um, I have my eyes on one very similar to what yours is, and I wanted to know how realistic it would be that we could use that as a chassis. You know, throw away most of the junk. We use it as a chassis to build the next uh, Robo Columbus kind of thing or Overland kind of thing because it seems like got beefy wheels. Um, going to have to beef the the suspension up a bit. Do we have? But do we? But is there enough controller in there that I can use that, or I got to throw that away? Um, yeah, I I was really hoping to get that going for that same reason myself. There's a ton of YouTube videos out there on how to, and uh, Doug ID says he's actually done it with some prior things but oh yeah i've, I've this made particular several, item, several of those yeah this particular one i'm just having trouble getting the box open yeah if you can't get the box open man I, that's not a problem i necessarily want to fix i want to i want to have to stack oh if i do i do but well, right. it's it's uh, uh, a lot of hey, but you know don't forget, uh i mean this started life as an rc car racer right this thing yeah and uh, uh but it was so old basically what i did was um Let's see. So I, I, uh, I basically uh, cut it at the wires and whatever was electronics beforehand or servos, they went away. So I found that a new uh, steering servo hap just happened to fit in just about the right size. Oh, okay. Yeah. And then for the motor, uh, instead of using the, because it was all an integrated piece of electronics. And I mean, there was no way I was going to hack into that. So I just used a modern servo, made it work, it was easy. Uh, and then I got a modern speed controller and hacked into the, directly into the brushed motor, just uh, 
uh, you know, two wires to the brush motor, put a connector on them and into the a standard. Uh, and then uh, that guy uses regular servo signals. So that and that mega 2560. And I got you. Garbage. <laughs> one, of the, one of the deals with, uh, not that I was trying to avoid it necessarily. I was looking, I did find the, the chassis I really wanted, but $1,000 on the X-Max Traxxas is not <laughs> going to be something I'm going to spend money for to tear apart, right? Yeah. So, so um, what I was really hoping for and, and looking for, and I was hoping Doug D would 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 uh, would would had shed some light on it. And I think you have shed some light on it. Is that uh, you know some have base chassis that I can start building on? Because I, I I went to Hobby Town, I, and this is one thing I hadn't looked a lot on. I went to Hobby Town and started looking at. There's a lot of parts that just fit. There's a lot of things that will because they're all they're not exactly all standard, but there's a lot of standards to choose from that you could manipulate those things to get done what you need to get done and i don't you know as fun as it is to build all that stuff and yeah, okay i'd rather just buy it and then latch on to it right instead of building it from the ground up you know so i got a battery and i've got a and i've got some motor that's going to run the damn thing and then i can work on it from there does that make sense does that yeah you know mm -hmm. i think a lot of us are with you on that harold Doug D. The 10th scale uh rc Car yeah. stuff is uh, is about is, is interchangeable. Yeah. Okay. A lot of this scale stuff. It, it, this is a was my first rover that I ever made. It was a uh, got it from um, what is the name of it? Goodwill. Okay, the chassis from Goodwill, and I just popped in and saw a big RC car. I mean, you know, I look at it and it's all what I call toy grade compared to, you know something like a Traxxas, but uh, it it ran uh, is, you know, that wasn't, the chassis was not the problem with this yeah. one. The problem was, you know, me have, trying to go from zero to getting up to speed on the software. Uh, but, so, I mean, you know, even just looking out, if you've got something big like that, the big problem, and, and what I'm trying to say is, Doug, that one was actually converted from, otherwise I'm using the original stock stock controller in there. I mean, I took it apart, you know, done soldered wires, put new wires on it, and hijacked basically all the chips off of the uh, transmitter, a receiver chip, I guess it would be. Yeah, that's what all the YouTube videos are showing. Yeah. You just put your multimeter on there and find out when you push this button on the controller, which one lights up. And that's the wire you have to hook your Pi to. Yeah. Or your yeah. Arduino. I figured it was just so much easier to just do the sippy sippy. The, the biggest said, problem, biggest problem with that approach is if the controller dies, you lose it all. Right. Now the other there's no, no replacing the original controller. The other option I'm considering is there's you can a put another of, one, but there's a number of robot chassis kits from some pretty big name robot dealers that you can just get that part. And as Harold said, you get the motors and all that working, and you can start working on the the robot intelligence part. Yeah, I have to make yeah. sure that the um, darn motors will run. Yeah, I'm just saying that that RC chat chassis that you have, you can get it to work. Believe me. No, I probably you know, can. I just have to find a way to get into the box. Yeah, the only it's thing that they say is if you get into the box and you find that the board <laughs> the board is buried in a, a tub of epoxy, then you just quit. <laughs> well, you don't quit. You just well, no, because <laughs> I mean it's only think of it, it's only two motor controllers, yeah. basically. Yeah, and, the steering servo and the going servo. Yeah, for motors. Yeah. So, I mean, you can, if you, you know, you can buy all of the new stuff and get it in and make it work. Question so I wouldn't you. give up on it yet. You just got to figure out how to get into that bottom yeah. part. Yeah, it's behind the battery. Yeah, some of those look pretty big, right? So some of those things, like, it's a pretty good size. It looks like there should be plenty of, uh, you know, <laughs> a big enough of a bread box to do all kinds of fun stuff to it and, you know, that kind of thing, right? So, yeah. Yeah. Why why are you uh using Docker, Harold, to, to run Ross in? 
Oh, because I, I had I have a theory. I have a, a thing. I got Docker. I uh, got that from the Zemo guys, and I say Zemo, the the Exomai, the European Space Agency that initially did the rover. And I want to I want to upgrade that. My theory was that I was going to uh, put the, the Docker containers on the Raspberry Pi, and then fire up whichever Docker container I cared for to do the things I needed to do. Like I've got a Ross One thing that works just fine. And I can drive it around with a joystick and that kind of stuff. But when I come to want to put uh, uh, the cognitive services, some of the finding the cones, the navigation services, all that kind of stuff on it, in order to get those nodes that exist, they don't run on the Docker image that I have. And then I've got several different versions of Python that are required from several different things. And I want to combine these things. And because uh, when I and also putting it on Docker, the idea is if I spend this time and effort to do this, and I want to now spin this robot up and stick it in a spin, a, spin another Raspberry Pi up, stick it in another robot. I just pull my Docker images. I got a few things, and now I've got I'm set up, ready to go. I mean, that's kind of the idea on it. Whether that's actually going to come to fruition or not, who the hell knows? But um, that's kind of the idea. I want to be. I wanted. I wanted to build something that was repeatable. So I could punk it up and chunk it on another pie and then go do stuff uh, with it going on. And I add more notes to it to do whatever I wanted to do on the new new deal. That was the idea. That that and I on my channel, on my stream, I know I mentioned it a bunch here. I practice something called RDD. I don't know if you've heard of RDD. Uh, you might have heard of TDD, which is test driven, test driven design, BDD, behavior driven design. Um, DDD, domain-driven design, and now we have RDD, which is the resume-driven design. So <laughs> there's all these things. <laughs> there's all these things that I want to learn and I want to play with, Docker being one of them that I need to have in in the world right now, in the consulting world, in the software. If you need to know a little Docker, you need to know a little of this, you need to know a little of all these things when you're having it. And, it, and it's not that somebody... Not that I'm not a smart guy, not that, not that not, not a lot of smart people, but if you haven't had exposure to it, at least a little bit, you can't even talk to it. So what I've been doing with my Mr. Big Head, the, the, my uh, talking head over here, that's all RDD, man. It's got Raspberry Pi, it's got .NET on a Pi, it's got Blazor, it's got Azure Functions, Azure Tables, uh, Cognitive Servers, services all built into the damn thing. And I got it on, I got it on GitHub. And I'm going to continue to work on it over over time and make and, and learn more and more about those technologies. And I've so, never, Harold, I've never used Docker. Um, when when do you use Docker? I mean, is it is is it just basically you want to create a self-contained, repeatable environment? Yeah, that's or, that's, that's a that's so a Docker very basically point. Docker basically if you have say Python mod if I got if I got Python code and I've got certain Python modules that I loaded, it'll download those modules that you need and do any compiles that you need is that the sort of thing it does that, that's the sort of thing i mean i think uh, the, the the term that's been used for the longest time has been microservices let's say i want to fire up a microservice that does, does this one thing and i need 27 of them right instead of doing that install once and then run trying to run 27 of them i just say hey here's a, hey uh, kubernetes because that's called orchestration by the way hey kubernetes here's a docker container that I want you to mimic 27 times out there and go and hit the go button and away it goes. And you don't care where it's running, you know where it's running, you know you can have access to it and do those sorts of things. And if I need I need to have a nice repeatable thing. In fact, that's why the ExoMy guys did it because they were trying to teach people how to install ROS on a Raspberry Pi and they were just pulling their heads out according to Max. I believe it was Max and Miro, one of the two. Yeah. And they said, well, hey, what if we just give them a Docker container and do all the stuff for them so they could just pull our container and we're done. And so that's what they did. And so that's kind of, I'm basing a lot of where I think I'm going with this Rover and how we're getting it set up based on their architecture and the way they laid out their project, which um, in this case, if you know anything about Ross, what you do is you have a base layer then you have an overlay and that's where in the overlay is where you put all your stuff so it references the base comes up references your stuff when you're running you're all running up here so you're not really touching the base of junk on there and so when when this ross container spools up 
it's going to load volumes or uh, basically virtual directories off of other GitHub repositories I have that are hold all those various various uh, bits and pieces I care about. And the the the, the ROS container itself will just uh, be there ready to hold them as soon as you fire it up a certain way. So I do all my work out here in GitHub and we save it all in GitHub and do all those sorts of things. And this has got just a virtual directory into it and you're using it and running it. So uh, that allows me to, uh, what because what happens with a DOS container, with a ROS, with a Docker container, every time it fires up, it's like a brand new machine. If you, you get up, you run it, you do a bunch of edits and stuff, you kill it. When it comes back up, your edits aren't throw, get there anymore because it wipes them all out. So yeah, you're you're talking more about how to how to start the environment after you've installed it. I've yeah. been, I think I could find Docker useful because, like for example, installing OpenCV on a Raspberry Pi. Basically, I write down every single little step I do so that I can repeat it later. And, and this is sort of the perfect. Uh, and, and, and so and so to, to to your point there, John, if you could figure out. Um, how you want to set up OpenCV where if you were to run it and you would have ports where you talk to it and come back. Like for instance, you have the OpenCV running this in this blob and I can go into it and come out of it for all the information you care. Then you should be able to take that blob, make it a Docker container, store it in a hub somewhere and every time you need it, hey, get me one of those and, and run it <laughs> on, the, on this application. And there's, there's, some, there's some hiccups and trips that I found in doing that kind of stuff that uh, I've learned a bit as we've been going through all this. It, isn't it also portable? So like if, if you have it running on a Raspberry 3, then you can just get another Raspberry 3B plus or four and you just pull the same Docker image down and boom, it runs. Uh, depends a little bit on the host OS because I've got some <laughs> of the things we've learned, whether it's you. In fact, I'm running Ubuntu on my Raspberry Pis now because the Raspberry Pi OS um, didn't want to play well with what I was trying to do. Although it would, it does play well, just not with ROS two, and some of the images that I'm trying to download. And what what happens here is there's a way to build a multi architecture image, and I'm not, mm -hmm. I'm not gotten to that yet. So if you're running it on a Ubuntu, you're running on a Windows box, you're running on uh, Raspberry Pi OS, those have different in images like the. This is a, a Ubuntu is running on an AMD 64 sort of thing. The uh, the Raspberry Pi OS looks like it's an ARM HF or ARM 32 V7. Those are different architecture layouts as you beat as you build up the image, and you're supposed to be able to build a Docker image that encompasses all of those things, so that when you download it, it runs the right version of that image. In fact, they call them repositories. It's a Docker repository. And then you run that in it, and that runs in a container. Can you can you recommend a, a resource Docker for dummies? Docker.org, Docker. Docker. man. Docker.org. There's some tutorials up there. Just go. That's just go. Is it Docker.org or Docker.com? There's the, the main site. It'll walk you through doing it. And I my depending upon I, the only thing I'd suggest is if you have a Linux box available to you, I would start there. You don't have to um, because you can run this under Windows subsystem for Linux. It's just that's another complication that you probably don't want to mess with when you're just figuring out Docker for the first time. Thanks. I mean, I've got it running on my, I've got, I've got all that, that stuff running on my lab laptop and it's a Windows 11 box, but it's, it, there's some extra stuff you need to do that you, you don't need to worry about first. Figure out your, what you want to do with Docker first, and then, and then worry about where you worry about running on a Windows box if you have to. That sort of thing. Does that makes sense. I've, I've gone to the Docker site before, but it's kind of like they they overwhelm you with everything that it can do, and it's like your head is spinning. You know, like wait a minute, I just want to do something simple. You know. Yeah, there's a there's a there's a there's a nice little there should be a nice little hello world for the Docker in the tutorials that basically you, you, this is you installing it. And this is you pulling an image, and this is you running an image, and you get the word "hello world" out, and and that's kind of where I start with that. Well, I think I think the use cases. It's important to think about the use cases. Like, why would you want to run Docker? And um, so one one reason, the most common use case 
is so that you have all of the installed dependencies for whatever software you're working on, and you can mm -hmm. have multiple robots. So that assumes that first you have a bunch of dependencies, and second you have a bunch of robots that you want to put this. <laughs> All the same. I, I plan on having a bunch of robots, but beside RDD, you know, because that's you know that's Harold's particular goal. Yeah, um, we we uh, we use that. We use Docker on um, up in Endeavor Robotics, where we were developing on those uh, those little Nvidia chips. Um, the Jetsons. The benefit there was that there were probably probably a hundred libraries or so that you needed to yeah. get all the vision and the robotics and the motor control and everything going. And then there were like dozens of robots scattered around the lab. And every time as you're developing something and I'm working on a camera and I say, oh, I need um, UVC something or other. Okay, then let me build that into the Docker image and ha and then deploy that to where everyone else can program that Docker image onto their yeah. robot. And then my software will run on their robot. So everyone else doesn't have to go through and put through the bank and find all that stuff. And, 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 to your point, and to your point, you could have, if you mess up one of those steps on like step three and it's a 57 step thing, and you get to 57 step and it doesn't work, and you don't realize you messed up step three, now you just wasted a bunch of time, right? So you get it right once, and now you get to hold on to it for a long, long, long time. Yeah, and that, that was where I was coming from with seeking to understand Harold's use case, um, is you know the multiple robots and the many packages. And um, so anyway, that I think those are the questions to ask yourself yeah. when you're considering using Docker. Well, I'm, well, part of it is I've got the resume-driven design working for me, and the other part of it is uh, I don't know anybody has Ubuntu on a Raspberry Pi with a, I could not find one in the Docker Hub. So at the end of all this, I would put that up there so if somebody else would like to use this and do whatever they want to do with it and go forward, it, it, who will, I don't know, because it'll be a base straight-up image, you know, nothing fancy on it. And then we'll use uh, run commands to mount up the various overlays and other things that we need to do for adding stuff in for our modules and our nodes and all that kind of junk. So you're going to copyright that phrase on uh, resume driven design? <laughs> no, 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 I can't do that. I got it from somebody else. I got it from somebody else. Okay. <laughs> I can't even remember where I got it from. So um, I'm running Ubuntu Mate on Raspberry Pi. Um, and it was pretty standard it was a pretty straightforward install there wasn't anything that yeah. really demanded that i use a docker image for it now one could have and, and one could have put that um like one of the ross containers on but i just didn't really see the reason and that's yeah that, paul i'm forcing it a little bit i certainly am there's no doubt about that i am forcing that 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 bit of technology a hair bit um it, it just, uh, I, I was the, the, my start, I started with, I wanted to keep the robot, the rover I have the way it is. So in case we get to go do in-person stuff again, I've got a working thing that I can pick in, hand, hand some kids some robot, so the com controller and we can have demonstrations and, and have, you know, create, hopefully create some more evil geniuses as we're out showing our stuff off when we get to do in-person things again. And then I wanted the, uh, so I didn't want to blow that away. I wanted to keep all of that. And that's all Docker eyes. So I, then I thought, well, I can make another set of Docker containers that would do all the fun stuff I want to do that gives me the advanced stuff that I care about that I'm developing in. And that's kind of what drove that Docker decision um, initially. Yeah. That, does that make sense? Yeah. And, 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 you know, just to go back to the multiple robots um, at, at, uh, at, um, at, uh, when I was working on the on the freight trucks, they were discussing they were discussing using Ubuntu, and and it was another very good use case because every time we cut the the dev team would come out with a new rev of, of software, they would have added in some more packages. So then you had to go and manually add the package, and as you said, Harold, 
but that's an error prone process. Error prone process. Yeah. And so they were dealing, they were considering um, containers as a firmware update mechanism. So then you don't even have any um, firmware or ROS packages on the base computers in the truck. You just program, reload re a, a container, and it's got like a blessed set of packages in it that's being tested and all the trucks are guaranteed to have the same packages because they all came got loaded with one with one docker image and yeah. that was a real good that was a real good use case yeah yeah uh, a lot of people that i've seen in the in the in in, in the uh, software application kind of industry they're using it in they usually use docker with an orchestrator like kubernetes so that I can run multiple of these things and be able to tell Kubernetes, I need 27 of these things up or I need 37 of them or I can kill half a dozen of them. And it fires them up in, on virtual machines wherever they need to fire them up and sets all the networking and stuff and all that kind of stuff. That was the original use that I've, that I've seen and, and the use that I see in the day-to-day -day work when I'm talking to, you know, I'm a consultant, I do software, I do things like that in, in my day-to-day -day life. That's where I see that. I don't see it normally as what we were just talking about here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Th that's exactly right. And I, and I've seen the seen the same thing that you want like X number of databases and then some other yeah. kinds of containers, and you don't care much what physical machine they run on. They're just yeah. packages of compatible exactly. software. So, oh, good talk, good discussion. It's awesome. Everybody, you know, I'm. I'm, I, I kind of like getting questions. I have to explain how I came out to it, and that uh, that helps me uh, solidify it or think, what the hell am I doing this for? <laughs> you know? so, I'm there, Harold. <laughs> what now? What now, Paul? Sorry for putting you on the spot. <laughs> no, not a problem, man. Not a, not a problem. I mean, this this is uh, again. That's what I'm a consultant for a living. I I hold. I, a software consultant, I, I, I run up against some really smart people all the time. It's not that I'm at a 24 hour interview all the time, but I, the company I work for improving, I mean, there's literally that They're, they want me to be as good as I can. And there's lots of people around there that are trying to help, will help me be better if I want to let them help me. And, um, part of that is putting them on the spot and asking, why is that? Why did you do that? And, uh, you know, uh, and, Sometimes I say, I don't know. It seemed like a good idea. It was pretty. I like the color. I don't know. You know, <laughs> so normally I get some smirks out of it when I do that. So we get to talk and let's go talk about it. And let's see, really, do we need to do that now? And we have a big old, usually a big old discussion about something. Sometimes it's not big, sometimes it's small. But uh, I'm, so I'm used to being put on the spot in all kinds of ways. And this is, this is, this is kind of fun that uh, I'm able to do that. Yeah, I'm able to do that. And when I'm doing my Twitch stream, they don't get to talk to, well, a couple of them do with the Mr. Big Head thing, but um, uh, they're asking me questions and I certainly don't want to let them down. And and one thing that I do, I think it's to my benefit, I get to, I can say, I don't know and be okay with that. And then we'll find out. You know, I know there's a lot of people that, that, that can't say those words. I don't know. I don't know about that. I don't know what the hell that is. Let's go find out. You know, I, and I think a lot of people have a hard time saying, I don't know. In fact, well, at least I've ran into a few people like that. Start making junk up, and I'm, no, I don't need that. You know. Anyway, and I was only going to talk a little. Holy crap. <laughs> it's all right, Harold. Good, good stuff. Thanks. Yeah. yeah. All good. You've, you've reminded me just how interesting Docker would be. So <laughs> you talked about RDD. Now I'm okay. Hey, about FDD, quick right? question. Fun. Quick, quick thing. Oh, sorry. If you haven't done it, covidtest.gov for free COVID tests. If oh, yeah. Done that, I've done that. I've done that. Okay. Okay. Hey, if you haven't done it, I might as well get a little something from them. Let's go. Yeah. I just yeah. want to make sure everybody knows if they hadn't hadn't done it. Okay. I'm not quite sure how a test is going. Never mind. I'll, I'll yeah, I, I, took the, I took the suggestion somebody made about having a wink in addition to a blink was easy enough. Just change the configuration file. So I got a winking now. Cool. <laughs> yeah. Productive. Okay. All right. Well, let's see. Have we missed anybody? I think we've gone around pretty well. 
I've got a question, not a, not a question, but a suggestion, I guess, for a topic at some point. Okay. And on uh, Git and merging and branching and all that fun stuff. Um, I've been using it, I've been trying to use it, um, but I'm not the best at when do I need to create a branch and put in some new features and how do you do it? How do you go back about merging it? I, I, I do have an answer for that. You create a branch every time you do something different than you're doing before. Now, I don't always do that, but that's the standard answer. The other thing is, is once you create a, a branch, you need to commit often. The standard phrase is, um, commits are like minions. They're numerous and small. So you can back the things out, right? And then once you have a branch, you'll, you'll uh, either uh, create a PR if you're doing all the right stuff, a pull request to pull it into whatever your main branch or master branch or whatever you want to call it going on there. And those are some few, few commands. I think, uh, I think, um, Carl, haven't you done a Git thing? You know, I've, I think I've done a little bit of a Git one. And I think before I did Steve, uh, Edwards did, but it's been a while. And, um, so what I've done, Pat is I've added, and I've done this, uh, uh, I've been adding notes to this uh, as we've gone through tonight. So we start off tonight with uh, Jack listing uh, 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 in terms of potential monthly sessions. So Ray, Ray, you volunteered to maybe give a prezo on your mill upgrade um, until we get the names confirmed. I mean, we've got one volunteer in the background for a Ross workshop, another volunteer for a Tesla intro self-driving beta. Um, and then I, th I picked up two wish lists because I think it might be interesting if uh, I know I would appreciate a, a Docker workshop, not from a resume driven, but from a fun driven or oh, fun -driven, knowledge, yeah. call, uh, K driven a knowledge driven design, right? <laughs> uh, KDD, KDD. KDD. Right? And then now you get, can copyright that because I don't know anybody said KDD before. So I don't no know. No KDD, just knowledge for the sake of knowledge. Yeah. How about how about WDD wish driven design? <laughs> All right. There you go. Alrighty there. We got one. Then we got a new one then. I haven't heard that one. I'll say not that I've heard everything, but that's one I haven't heard. Hey, uh, just a, a uh, clarification on GitHub branching. I'm not sure, Harold, that I fully grasp the use case you provided. If it works like a traditional software configuration management that I'm used to in my experience, there's two reasons why you want to create a branch. One is when you have multiple people working on a project and you want each one wants to be able to pursue changes yes. individually until merging. The second one is if you're working on a project alone, but you've got a nice stable version that works and you want to make incremental changes that can easily be, that, that won't affect the working version until you're ready, you're fully tested and ready yep. to commit. Yep, is, you, is you, expanded upon my, you expanded upon my, uh, my high eyes, TLDR, TLDR didn't, you know, too long didn't read kind of version of it. And I, I agree with you, John. I agree with you. I agree that that's one of my problems. I'm really good at taking software that works and making it not work. <laughs> <laughs> Let branches and staged commits be your friend. Yes. So, so that's why well, I'd like to know a little bit is, more. That is FDD, failure driven development. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, Pat, what do you? Th I mean, uh, would would you like? What do you think? Would you like like, uh, like a workshop, or maybe we take a half an hour next Tuesday night, or something like that? That would work for me. It's a, uh, it's just the base. I know you had touched on it, and I hadn't really gotten into it when you did your talk on it. Uh, you did during one of our meetings. Yeah. And then I don't know. Steve already has one online. Um, I mean, there's a bunch of prezos, but it's, I think it's easier if you just talk to something. So like, for example, this is, uh, it goes from bottom to top. And I mean, I won't get into how you do things here, but I, I use this v, uh, Git history ex, uh, add on to Visual Studio Code. And this is for that duct tape and bailing wire thing that I've got. And uh, you can see I have each one of these red ones is a different kind of like branch tip. And it works from bottom to top. So you can see that I was working on um, uh, some modifications that, uh, on the mainline thing here. Then Raj, my partner, did, did this uh, commit with a bunch of changes. 
then we merged that back into this branch uh, where we integrated the camera. And then I made a I made a new branch from there, which I called bounce between two cones on level payment. It's because I knew that this one was kind of working and, and I didn't want to mess with it. And I didn't know how long it would take to do this. So, and it takes a while to go way back until you find the like main branch, which was a certain point in time stable. So my branches go all over the place, but anyhow. Yeah, it's, but at least you can, you know, you can go back and find out Hey, where did I go, or how did I? How did where did I go wrong? Let me go yeah, back. And, exactly. And, you see, and and like when I do the commits, like I have a couple really big ones in work now. But um, when I do commits, like like this is like I click on this one, and I click on this one. You know, they're really compared to on the day job. These are really sloppy commit messages. But you know, I just to remind myself what I did, and I I use this. I used to have like a a kind of a backlog, just a notepad file where I keep track of my backlog, what I wanted to do next. But now I just put that so, because, you know, this is a snapshot. This is where I am now. Well, it's fresh in my brain. What would I do next? Well, next, I'm going to clean up dead code, maybe cache or filter the initial heading, uh, add a slight pause between turnaround, improve the loop. So the cool part I like about doing it this way is that as, I, as the code, like me, it's a fun project, right? So as the code meanders its way along on whatever path it's going to take, I can look at any point in time and, and see, well, oh, yeah, I did that set of changes. And at that point in time, I was thinking ahead in this direction. But when I go back three or four commits, I was at this point in time and I was thinking to go in this direction. So now I can go back and, and quickly get my brain in a certain mindset and then figure out, okay, so based on the past, the past is water over the dam. I'm here now. What do I want to do next? <laughs> Yeah, well, that's, I, I do the same kind of thing. I get up and do a branch, and I'm like, you know, I'm about to try this really dumb thing. Yeah. And I want to see if it works or not. So I just kick off a branch, and if the dumb thing works, I merge it. I, I, I do a, I merge. I do a PR back in. If it's, if the dumb thing doesn't work, then I just get to delete the branch, and I'm still okay. Branches are what it gets most. Yeah, and um, I, I was just wondering if if. Carl, like you were talking about doing a demo, maybe you want to show of hands as to who might be interested, although we've lost quite a few people already, but uh, certainly I would. You've got uh, a hand raised. Yeah. Doug has a hand. I mean, I've, I've, probably, I've probably dealt with six or seven different configuration management systems ever since in, in my entire career, maybe more, but uh, and, and the principle is the same. Principles. I'm guessing you did some RC work, probably some C, CVS, maybe some SCC, not SCCS. SVN. Yes, some SVN. Yeah. Try to guess. Yeah. Get 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 came, and I'm like, wow. And it's it's held on for a really 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 long time. For I've got a really dumb question, Carl. You had the commit messages; they were hundreds of characters long. Yeah. Is that a setting in VS Code to change the commit message length? I'm stuck to 50 characters. I think that's the default. Okay. Um, I have no idea. All, all I do, what I do is I literally have a text file notepad. I, and even though I have VS Code, I actually use Notepad++ on the side. So I can pose the commit messages there, right, in yeah. in VS Code. I mean, I mean, a, a commit messages in Notepad++. And then when it comes time to commit, I'll just copy and paste from Notepad plus plus over. The way it goes. Yeah, I just, I'll, I'll take. I, I always assumed it was a Git thing, so I'll uh, I'll take a look in VS Code and see if I can find out where the. Yeah. Well, you know, Carl, some would say that if you need that complicated a commit message, you're probably waiting too long between commits. <laughs> yeah, some, might, some might say that. Yeah. Or you have a very short memory. <laughs> Some might agree with you as well. I mean, but you know, okay. So then, then you get insight, right? Because it, it, and and this is where you may not want me to do the presentation because I, I I've been learning by osmosis by watching paid developers, but I I really don't have a background in software that way. But so you can see that, like, I, I have I've wanted to get it to a certain point before I committed it, but the changes have just snowballed. So like. I have all these that are staged, which means I'm really, in my way of thinking, I'm really comfortable with them. But you can see that like here, um, I have some changes on top of these changes that aren't even staged yet. So these right here, 
This is. <laughs> oh, so you're you're okay. Yeah, I see. Your commit message is for is for multiple files that all have to work together. So oh can... hell yeah. Okay. Oh hell yeah. I mean, I do it no other way. So like this guy. So here, this this latest one. Here, I had eleven. I had eleven ads on here and this file. So, oh yeah. Well, that's to my way of thinking. That's the power of it. Yeah, it still sounds like you're a candidate for learning annual, <laughs> where everything is about small, fast changes. Well, yeah. So if you go back and look at that's a whole other story, though. Well, yeah. <laughs> so you mean like this commit, right? Where I had exactly this many changes. I mean, it just depends on what's going on in my brain at the time. So, and all I did in this commit was get rid of these comments, or I, I added them. Yeah, I added them. That was a whole commit. So, What's your commit rate per hour? On that day, <laughs> on that day, it was, well, pretty high. I had one two minutes apart. But then then now you have like months between. Yeah, so don't look at me if you want consistency. <laughs> well, you know, at... certainly we could put our filter on, you know, for those of us who spent our careers in software development. I mean, look at, we look can at this, out right? some of that. Here, like I was, must have been busy on August nineteen. August, well, that was the day before. Yeah, that was that was the week before I had to leave because my dad's sickness, and then Raj took over. So there was a bunch. That was a busy day, right? Look at that. And then we, then there was nothing until I picked it up again around Thanksgiving, and then I've just been picking away at it since then. And yeah. All yeah, because right. a lot of this will come down to to philosophical discussions about your approach right. to software yeah. development and how much yeah. of a process guy you are, and so on. There's well, definitely, that, you know, I, I don't have anyone in. else that I'm having a team with at the moment, except for the past version of me. So, yeah. <laughs> yeah, well, what works, whatever works for you. Yeah, and and eventually you learn, you know, if you if you have your own, everybody has their own development processes, you right. know, they work outside of a company that's not dictating the process for you. Um, uh, and eventually you learn from mistakes, you know, like if you, if you saved up too many changes but without committing them, then, then you lost them one time and it cost you several days of development. You go, maybe I should have done that in, in, a, yeah. in such a way that I had smaller pieces that I could then start working. Maybe I should have pushed that to GitHub about a month ago. Oh, yeah. I got yeah, I got <laughs> lots of rules. I got lots of rules when it comes to that. Even in my personal in my personal thing, sometimes I forget because I get tired and don't when I'm doing my stream here. I do it here. I, I make it a rule to do it. Sometimes I don't follow the rules, but most of the time I do. As well as I do at work, when I leave the work or I'm done with the stream or I'm done with whatever it is, the last thing I do is I commit all my changes and push them up because you never know when stuff gets to go away and i'm going to guess that github is not going away anytime soon if it ain't GitHub, make it bit make it make it uh bit bucket. Uh, bucket or GitLab or any other whatever cloud storage service you want to be in that's what you that you know shove it up there and your machine can die and you don't lose that yeah. well, the, the thing is is that you don't have to commit a working uh, no. code. You can no, commit no, partials as long as, as long as you understand what's on that branch doesn't yeah. work yet. And in fact, I know this is getting a bit in the discussion. Sometimes I will commit and leave a broken thing in the place so that when I come back in and hit the compile button again, oh, that's where I need to start working. I'll yeah. just leave me. Bread Never do board. that on the master branch. <laughs> What? Yeah. what are you talking about? What are you talking especially about? Working, especially if you're working with multiple people on a project. Talk about yeah, these exactly. Fast. Yeah. What are you talking about? I don't we know had it. Talking about when you have automated testing going on, automated build testing. You know, it's like uh, we uh, there was one project yeah. we were working on where anytime somebody broke uh, broke the code, uh, it would automatically be picked up and uh, and yeah. we would like. It would automatically play. Uh, we would automatically broadcast like Darth Vader's theme. <laughs> yeah. There's a, there was a. Uh, I don't know if they're still in business, but there's this thing called Siren of Shame. It still may be out there if you want to go look it up. Siren of Shame. It was this thing. It's about this big. It's a red light with LEDs yeah. in it that would flash patterns, and it would do that very thing for him. That um, and you could have a unique pattern per user. 
So if I broke <laughs> it, it would flash a certain way versus somebody <laughs> else breaking it, it would flash a different way. And of course, the computer is hooked up to play sounds and stuff and do all kinds of fun stuff like that. Yeah, you get fun blaming the person who broke the broke yeah, the rules. You do. Yeah, you do. Isn't there even a isn't there even a function in Git called blame? Yeah, Git blame. No, Git blame can can be your worst enemy or your best friend depending <laughs> on which side of that line you're on. <laughs> At least it's transparent, right? We know what this function does. <laughs> yeah. Let's place the blame. Yeah, exactly. That's exactly what it does. Lots of lots of fun stuff there. Cool. Well, gentlemen, I think I am going to call it done for this evening. This has been All a great right. night, by the way. In oh, a whole bunch of ways. Bunch of ways. Whole bunch of ways. I'm going to take that as uh, it's time to call it a night. So is is there a going twice? Going twice. twice. Good night. All right, guys. Have a good night. Good night. Good night.